I know we're all anxious to get back together after COVID, and, and so we really look forward to uh, sharing with you today. Before we really begin uh, with our program, I'd like to take a moment and uh, welcome you all through song. I achake, Mainde to all along, Gicke, Waha, Miam Yonge, Nungene Hiniangue, Miam Yonge, Wah Pia Yangue, Missionewe Pia Yque, Nehesa, Weake Tehetawe. I achake, we're going to start by singing a, a community song to recognize that we're coming back together as a community out of this period of isolation and then a song about uh, welcoming uh, guests to our homelands. Yeah, yeah. 
Does everybody hear me okay? All right. Okay. Sounds good. Great. All right. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters here uh, before we launch. You'll notice we've got some art tables in the back, and I encourage you when you have time or on break or if you're moving in and out, feel free to stop by the tables and visit with folks. I'd also ask that you take a moment and silence your cell phone like I'm going to do right now. <laughs> okay, I'm good. <laughs> and our format is going to be consistent with what we've done in the past. And what we'd like to do is uh, allow the presenters as much time as possible to present. Uh, we don't uh, do a question and answer uh, here in the audience, but what we, the speakers will all have tables set up out front of where the breakfast was at this morning. And you're free to go there and, and visit with the speakers and, and have in-depth conversation with them. And we found over the years that that interaction actually works pretty well. So the speakers will be set up at their tables at the designated time. I believe that's information has all been provided for you. Uh, let's see. So in March of 2020, we were preparing to hold this very conference. Well, we, we all know what happened, so I no reason to uh, go into that. But here we are, two years later, picking up the threads that we were forced to, to put down. I want to begin by acknowledging the challenges our tribal communities faced during the pandemic. Many communities were already under great pressure to preserve their languages as older generations of first language speakers were passing. The pandemic only exasperated that reality. But we remain resilient and determined to continue the work that is so important to preserving our identities as indigenous people. Today's conference is just one example of the accomplishments we continue to make as Miamia people even when challenged by events beyond our control. Today, we will put forward our most recent activities and developments that directly support our ongoing efforts to reconnect Miamia people to each other and to their Miamia knowledge system. Central to this broad effort is the unique relationship we have with an institution that bears our name 
Miami University. The relationship between Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma has never been stronger than it is today. In this current year of 2022, we celebrate 50 years of relationship building, a journey that began in 1972 when then Chief Forrest Olds made a trip to campus to visit an institution he had only heard about. A partnership that would evolve over time, developing a level of respect and commitment towards the education of tribal youth and other members of the campus community. Napon Dingi, learning from each other, is the phrase we use to describe what is truly an amazing outcome of years of efforts by many individuals, some of you in this room today. Kikwe Situle, I want to show my respect to you all. I am honored to be embedded within this effort to serve as the executive director of the Miamia Center, an entity dedicated to the preservation and promotion of our Miamia knowledge system and to introduce the lineup of incredible tribal scholars and educators who will be sharing our work with you today. I also want to personally thank our tribal leaders who are present here today. Our tribal leaders play an important role in this effort. We simply would not be able to do what we do without their direct support. And to that end, I'd like to welcome Akima, Chief Doug Lankford. <clears throat> Nijuna Menge Akema, Second Chief Dustin Olds. Where are you, Dustin? <clears throat> Metame Achimwa, First Council Person Tara Hatley. <clears throat> Nijuna Menge Achimwa, Second Council Person Scott Willard. In the back there. Mm -hmm. And Alchimwa Council Person uh, Danya Williams, who was not able to make it today, um, she is also serves as our Secretary Treasurer, and I believe that she's joining us online today. <clears throat> I want to thank these leaders for taking time out of what is a really uh, busy, busy schedule uh, to come and, and join us today. We're going to try to stay uh, on task. I think if we weren't doing virtual, um, you know, we might be able to have a little bit more flex. But since we have so many individuals that um, are logging on to see certain specific presentations, uh, we're going to try to stay on task as much as we can. So at least within a, a few minute, um, few minute window. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of introduction to the individual speakers, mainly because you know we have all of the bios, profiles, uh, introductionary videos on the website, and we hope that you've taken some time uh, to, to familiarize yourself with who the speakers are. That allows us to spend more time uh, giving our speakers a chance to really share the work that they're engaged in. In the past, I've given some commentary, sometimes before, sometimes after a presentation. Um, a lot of times I try to just give some context. All of this work is connected to each other. And so when we talk about revitalization, whether it's language, whether it's culture, whatever it is, from our perspective in a tribal community, it's really the revitalization of the entire community. There isn't any aspect of that community that is not affected or plays an important role in supporting any revitalization activities. So although, yes, language and culture are important, we focus on those, we also recognize that there's a lot of other revitalization activities around that. Um, everything from economic development, to protecting our sovereignty, to building our land base as a tribal uh, community, um, developing a wide range of resources that that's feed and support that. So, Try to keep in mind that these presentations are all very connected in that way. The vast majority of the work of the Miamia Center is really focused on 
what we as a tribal community in Northeast Oklahoma need for our citizens who live in diaspora. They, they live all over the United States. We do have central locations in Oklahoma, Kansas, in the homelands of Indiana and Ohio because of the forced relocations that our ancestors experienced. <clears throat> that work is central to preserving the nation. Simply put, our ancestors preserved through the treaty process their inherent right, it was not a right granted to us, it's an inherent right to govern ourselves, to direct our activities, and to serve our people in what we collectively think is in the best interest of the nation. And language and cultural revitalization plays a really, really important uh, role in that. You're going to see a lot of different aspects of that, everything from our growing student base to our technological development to our educational development. And it's, it's really huge, it's big, and it's more than what we actually have the resources to do. So we're in a, we're in a process of, of growth, of expansion, of, of planning, and trying to figure out what this is gonna look like for us. It's only been since the 1990s that legislation was established in the United States for the first time giving protection to our indigenous languages and cultures. The passage of the 1990 Native American Languages Act, the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and other acts that happened during that time have been really, really critically important. That's not that long ago. And when you think about a revitalization effort and the kind of work that we do, it's intergenerational. And it's just going to take time. And we need to be able to have space to figure out what that's going to look like for us and to be able to put some legs under an effort like this. And so what really Miami University has done is it's given us that space to explore that. And that's what the Miami Center is. So as you look at these presentations today, what you're, what you're seeing is you're seeing us trying to figure it out. In many cases, the te technology isn't even there for us and the tools aren't there for us because a lot of the software packages were not developed for the kind of work that we do. So in some cases, we have to literally develop the technological tools, our tools of the trade, in order to do that work. You're gonna see various technology pieces today that are in different stages of development. And like a lot of technology, there's always a starting point, but there's almost never an ending point in their development unless you just continue that software. And there have been cases in our past where we have invested heavily in software only for that software to be discontinued 10, 15 years down the, down the road. And that's been very frustrating for us. So I would say probably in the last 10 years, we've really started to take on the responsibility of, of building and managing the software that we need in order to promote and, and do the work uh, that we're all here to do. So I think that's the best way I can describe in a, in a, in a broad sense what these presentations are gonna be today. I encourage you all to engage with people around you. There's over 100 tribal members that have registered uh, to be part of this conference. So a large part of this audience are tribal citizens. Uh, we're all here to support each other and, and also to learn and to share. And we wanna do that in the context of Miami University's campus. So don't hesitate to engage with people uh, if you know they're from the tribe. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our very first speakers. Now, I mentioned earlier that the vast majority of our work was for the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, but we've long recognized that the work of language and cultural revitalization is now a global issue. And many years ago, we invested in a program that was born out of California uh, called Breath of Life. And Breath of Life eventually became a national program funded by National Science Foundation. And in 2015, the Miamia Center became the institutional home. We felt very strongly that we needed to at least carve out some of our resources to be able to support that because as tribal communities, we need to have a, a, a venue by which we share these development ideas and these approaches. And by doing that, we strengthen all of us. And so the National Breath of Life is our only national program. 
uh, but it's one that's growing very fast as more and more tribes enter that space where they have to rely on archival materials uh, to develop language and cultural programs. And to that end, I want to uh, introduce uh, my colleagues uh, who uh, direct the National Breath of Life program, Dr. Gabriela perez Baez and Jerome Viles. Thank you. <clears throat> Um Jala Dane Honashi, um Tashke Miyamiaki, She do Jerome Viles, um Che Met Dane Nashli, Salatsi Nashli, Chinook Hichu Nashli, Kalapuya Dan Sasta, um Yamiongi Dan Sasta Jishres, he won Shishrechan. So hello people, um chiefs, leaders, the Miami people. Um I'm Jerome Viles. I come from people living in a village called Che Met at the mouth of the Rogue River in southwestern Oregon. I'm enrolled at the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. Uh, my family is also Chinook Indian from the mouth of the Columbia River. I live in Kalapuya territory today with my family in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm happy to be in the homelands of the Miami people today. For the past decade, I've worked in various capacities to help my people and our related tribes in revitalization of our languages. This led me to pursue a career in linguistics, specifically focused on working with archival materials. Much like the revitalization of the Miami language, um, my heritage language of Nuea or Oregon Dene is occurring largely without first language speakers. Um, so the written and audio materials that our elders left us are critically important. I now serve at the Miyamiya Center as a National Breath of Life Archives Development Trainer, but before that I worked as a member of a project at the Northwest Indian Language Institute to build an archive, um, a digital archive of my language. And through that project, we piloted the broader release of the MIDA software developed by the Miami Tribe and the Miyamiya Center that has evolved into what we call ILDA today. Um, I'm here with, as Daryl said, our National Breath of Life co-director, and I'm gonna turn it over to her now to introduce herself and get the presentation started. I'm not that tall. Shashila <laughs> Mishinewe. Um, let me... Um, ah, yeah. um, my name is Gabriela Perez Vaz, as you heard, um, and you'll notice that my name has a lot of, um, a couple of accent marks. I'm from Mexico, born and raised, and you might wonder what I'm, I'm doing here. Um, I became a linguist after an attempt at becoming a graphic designer. I became a linguist uh, because I wanted to contribute to the sustainability of indigenous languages back home in Mexico. Uh, and so that's what I did during my dissertation work, my doctoral work. And eventually I got a job as the curator of linguistics at the Smithsonian Institution. And I discovered uh, the amounts uh, of archival materials of Native American languages um, held at repositories like the one at the National Anthropological Archives uh, that I was in charge uh, of. But I, most importantly, I discovered what had been happening and what was happening with Native American languages, both from the language endangerment point of view, but more importantly, the language revitalization point of view. And I began working since 2010 in National Breath of Life. So let me walk you through uh, what that uh, path has been so that I can tell you what we've been working on since then. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that this material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, we have received substantial support uh, from the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, uh, the Miami Center, of course, the Miami University, the Smithsonian Institutions, uh, Recovering Voices, the University of Oregon, which is the institution where I am now, uh, and additional in-kind support from the National Anthropological Archives, the uh, National Museum of the American Indian, um, and the Library of Congress. Um, so the point of departure is the language endangerment situation. Uh, it's very difficult to 
um, count languages, and it's very difficult to assess the vitality at which they are. But a couple of sources seem to be a little bit consistent, so I took those numbers just to give us a sense of the extent of endangerment and therefore revitalization efforts. Um, according to a publication, Simons and Lewis, 2013, um, there are 18 Native American languages in North America, so counting the US and Canada, um, that are in vigorous use. Um, there are 85 or so languages that are endangered at various degrees, uh, and there's 163 or thereabouts uh, languages that at some point in their history reached the point of dormancy, meaning the a point in which they did not have um, first language speakers. Um, and of course, then languages such as uh, Miamia, um, with active revitalization efforts after this period of dormancy, are what we refer to as awakening languages. So all our efforts are, um, all the efforts of the National Breath of Life are in support of awakening languages. Oh. <laughs> it got bumped well. apparently. So. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, because I was still getting the feed from back there. So, yeah, it's detecting the other display now. Yeah. All right. They're checking back here. Is it still out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it got bumped. I don't know if I have to. Yeah. That. This keeps detecting it over and over again. So. That's a kind of objective. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> No, we need our the, the best thing I can do right now is probably shutting everything down and restarting it. In the system? Yeah, but I would keep the projectors up in a few minutes. I don't. Well, we want the slides to work, so I guess we have to do what we have to do. All right, so you want me to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. What if you want to the full stuff? Yeah, we, we, they're doing their thing. Um, yeah. If you send them up, it's going to take five minutes to send them back down. Is it going to take five minutes or something mm -hmm. like that? Okay. Well, that's the only thing we can do right now. It's going to take about uh, five minutes to get this reconfigured properly. So sorry about the interruption. We'll get back to you as soon as we can, which is five minutes. It cut out a few minutes before we came up. We're trying to figure out what that is. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Things happen. Yeah, no, we're I'm sorry. Just thinking whether there's anything that I can trim. You know what's funny is I almost brought our little mobile projector just in case this happened. I'm like, this isn't going to happen. And then this happens. <clears throat> So is the clicker working? The clicker, well, yeah. So you were advancing everything. It was still feeding and all of that. Just the projectors. Can we use this clicker instead of the yeah? You can use that clicker or yeah, because it's in the avoid touching the computer. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, this is still working. Okay. Yep. This kind of thing happens. They're restarting the yeah, they have to re there are our whole thing is working, their whole thing is not. So um, we had an issue similar to this when I tested it like two weeks ago and they were confident they fixed it. So it'll be about five minutes. They said it'll be about five. I think probably about three and a half. Three and a half. Well, I'll be speaking so I can go. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think we uh, can. Okay. Yeah, like this. This happened. I think I told you that this happened a couple of weeks ago, and kind of like, yeah, we got to we'll get to zero. So apparently, whatever it was, it's been fixed too early. Yeah. I should uh, get back to this in earnest. So then I was, as I was saying, um, so there's this concept of awakening languages, which is central to the work of um, National Breath of Life. Um, and it's rather a growing mo uh, movement at this point. Um, so with a couple of other colleagues, I ran a survey of language revitalization efforts worldwide uh, a few years ago. And out of 245 efforts that we documented, 
one in five was an effort to uh, revitalize a language that had been dormant at some point. Um, in North America, we know that there are more dormant languages that have an active revival effort than languages, dormant languages that do not. And about half the awakening languages in the world are in North America. Um, a critical resource for these efforts are uh, archival language resources. Uh, languages have been documented uh, throughout history by community members, by missionaries, uh, by government entities like the Bureau of American Ethnology, and by academics of various sorts, anthropologists, linguists, and so on. Um, and so the mission of the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages is to work with these uh, awakening language communities to build capacity around methods um, in archive-based research for community-directed revitalization uh, efforts in these awakening language contexts. Um, since 2011, when National Breath of Life held its first um, workshop, we have provided training uh, to 137 Native American community researchers from 65, uh, working on 65 different languages. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of the history. Um, in 1993, there was a workshop at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, and uh, out of this workshop emerged a publication called Paper and Talk. Um, also in the, min in, in the same decade, in 96, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival developed a training workshop to support uh, the revitalization of native dormant languages, specifically in California. This was the Breath of Life Archival Institute for California Indigenous Languages, and they were working with community members representing about 30 languages at the time. And since then, they have held biannual workshops at, uh, that access materials at the Bancroft Library, uh, the Phoebe Apperson um, Hearst Museum of Anthropology, and the Survey of California and other Indian languages. Uh, there have been other regional uh, workshops, a couple at the University of Washington, I believe three at the University of Oklahoma, Norman, and one at the University of British Columbia uh, in Canada. So as I mentioned earlier, the National Breath of Life uh, started in 2011, or that was the first workshop. Uh, and this was the first uh, workshop of national scope. Um, we um, benefited from the vision and logistical contributions from, the, from ICOs, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. Um, the first two workshops, 2011 and 13, were organized by the Endangered Language Fund through Lisa Conathan and Doug Whalen and supported uh, by the National Science Foundation. Um, at that time, um, we were offering two-week workshops focused on the importance of gathering archival language materials for revitalizations, uh, uh, revitalization out of the um, DC repositories. Um, the, the workshops were co-hosted by the National Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of the American Indian, both of which uh, are at the Smithsonian Institution and also by the Library of Congress. So at that point, that's when I was already working at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, the workshops, in addition to providing guidance and access to the archival materials, offered introductory courses in linguistics uh, with the purpose of uh, showing the participants what linguistics could do to advance their efforts and also workshops and or um, lectures on revitalization strategies that focused on the use of those archival materials. So uh, we offered biennial workshops uh, in 2011, 13, 15, and 17. And as Daryl said, in 2014, that's when the Miamia Center becomes the institutional home of the National Breath of Life, and Daryl and I teamed up to co-direct the institute. So since then, um, we have worked, uh, well, through these introductory workshops, we have offered training to community researchers from all of these languages. There are, all, there are over 50 languages on this list, and you can see the, uh, the um, distribution. They're all across um, North America. Um, now, over time, of course, we started to identify certain needs, especially with regards to greater access to trainer, uh, training um, and program assessment and evaluation. 
So um, whenever we held a workshop, we would receive over 100 applications, and we could only accept about 20 to 25 applicants. Um, so at present, we are currently uh, we're working to increase access to training. Um, we are developing a self-directed training program, which will be offered free of charge on a learning management system, online, asynchronous, now that we're used to all of that stuff, um, full of multimedia, um, so that um, uh, community researchers can access this training at any time uh, from their home and not having to leave their home for two weeks to get the training. Uh, this is work that is being supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we also were prompted by and funded by the National Science Foundation to carry out a third-party program assessment and evaluation. Uh, the work was directed by Kristen Morio um, at Miami University's Discovery Center for Evaluation, Research, and Professional Learning. Uh, the assessment focused on the 2017 workshop. Um, the team carried out a pre-workshop and a post-workshop -quest questionnaire, as well as a longitudinal impact assessment, uh, talking to alumni from the four workshops. Um, and this is what we learned. So one of the questions, or many of the questions sent, uh, in, in the questionnaire centered on the goals that the revitalization practitioners, community researchers were bringing in when they started the uh, uh, workshop in 2017. And as you can see on the left side of your screen, uh, hopefully, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a great interest in locating and discovering those archival materials that will support the revitalization efforts. Um, and an even greater interest in learning how to analyze those materials to derive enough information about the language to implement that into their revitalization efforts. Now, to, uh, after the workshop, after the two weeks, what we see is that the needs to know how to find those materials um, come down in frequency in these uh, questionnaires uh, because now the participants feel confident that at any time they can go back and find the materials themselves. Um, there's still an interest in learning more about how to analyze these materials, but then there's a ballooning interest in creating uh, tools that will make these materials accessible more broadly in the community. There's an interest in sharing and in increasing the impact of these materials and in planning collaboration uh, within the community to use these materials for revitalization. So with this um, information in mind, we started to conceptualize a longer term vision for the type of training that we could offer um, to awakening language communities. So we were fairly comfortable uh, in knowing that um, we were guiding effectively uh, the participants through a process of gathering materials. And here we're using the metaphor of basket weaving, right? So the um, workshops that, I, that I've been talking about were about gathering those materials that would be used for the weaving process. Um, but sometimes, and luckily, um, these materials would be really copious. So I remember being at the uh, archives one day with a group of community researchers who had about 80 boxes of about 2,000 pages each uh, on their language. And they arrived equipped with notebooks and pencils. And that was a key moment for me to realize, well, um, there needs to be um, tools that will support the organization of these materials, the processing of the materials, especially since the processing is very iterative. So maybe you go through a page, you discover certain things, you go back to that page, you discover new things, you need to code that information in alongside that original archival page so you can keep track of it and build upon that analysis over years, right? Um, so that's when we started thinking about what to, how to process uh, these materials. Um, moving forward, um, our path will hopefully take us to thinking more about how to weave all of this work into the revitalization uh, activities. And perhaps here I just want to clarify that this is a, a model of philology, Native American philology, not necessarily a model for uh, revitalization. 
Uh, we understand, we're very keenly aware of the fact that each community goes into revitalization at different paces in different ways. Um, the process of gathering and processing and weaving happen alongside each other, simultaneously overlapping. This is just a way in which we conceptualize the training uh, that we can offer. Um, so we're squarely at the module two processing stage, which is what uh, Jerome will talk to you about. Okay. Um, thank you, Gabriela. I just, yeah, wanted to add, um, I really like this weaving metaphor. I come from um, basket weaving people, as I know Miami people are, and I think most of us across the continent are. But um, another way I like to think and talk about this model is in thinking about um, layers of accessibility, or rather inaccessibility. And that's re what really got me into work with my community was um, the desire to repatriate our archival materials, our cultural and language information back to the community. So the first layer of inaccessibility and what really is being addressed in module one is just uh, physical access. Um, the writings and recordings of Indian languages that were gathered through the history of the US like Gabriela talked about have historically been locked up at archival institutions or universities and largely inaccessible to the communities and people they come from. So in module one or those workshops Gabriella was talking about by bringing these native language workers um, like myself and my brother in that picture, um, we brought them to the archives to see, handle, take pictures of, get digital copies of these archival materials. National Breath of Life was really addressing that physical inaccessibility, but um, what comes next? What comes after you have physical or digital access? Um, that's just the first step in peeling back these layers of inaccessibility so that the materials and the important information in them can be brought back to communities or repatriated to our communities. So say I have, and this is largely what happened to me and my group, um, say I have 10,000 pages of written materials, digital copies of written materials in PDF form, a lot of it's word lists, partially translated stories, verb tables, 200 or so hours of audio recordings of speakers telling stories or um, going over things with a linguist. But what we really need right now is to tell folks at our tribe how to start having a conversation or talking about things in their home. So how do I search through all that material um, to find what we need to build language programming to support revitalization in our community? And then once I've found it, how do I share it? Um, and how do I find it again? Um, I, everyone I've talked to who does this type of work has these moments. Where I, kn I know I saw that in this PDF, but I don't know exactly. And then you spend hours flipping through page by page by PDFs or listening to an hour long audio for the one word that you know is in there. On top of that, Many, if not most or all of those archival writings are in alphabets that aren't in use by communities today. And I know the Miami people are very familiar with that. Um, so each person who wrote languages down had a different ear for the sounds and thus different accuracy when they were writing it down. And they were also all using their own individual alphabets. So even when I do find the words that I need, I might not have any idea how to interpret them or pronounce them. So that, there's that physical inaccessibility, but these things um, I like to talk about largely as organizational and intellectual inaccessibility. And it's really what we realize with our, in our model, we need to be addressing um, for these communities to continue working with them and supporting their work. And it's where we're developing programming now. So building on the assessment work of the Discovery Center, uh, the su success and experience of the Miamia Center and Miami Tribe, as well as our whole team's experiences in language revitalization and archival work, we designed a module two workshop with the goal of training community researchers to increase the accessibility, organizational and intellectual accessibility of their archival materials, first by typing them up and then by storing them in our Indigenous Languages Digital Archive, or ILDA, software, which makes them searchable and accessible to language researchers who are developing materials for revitalization in communities. 
We also designed this workshop to introduce communities to the ILDA dictionary platform, which serves as a pathway to disseminate the language and cultural information from the archive to the community at large. We've held two of our module two workshops. The first was here at Miami University in 2019. And the second was at the Northwest Indian Language Institute at the University of Oregon in 2021. Each workshop was a week long and brought five community research teams to the respective campuses to work with us. In total, we hosted um, 10 communities from across the country. Most were alumni of previous Breath of Life workshops, uh, National Breath of Life workshops in Washington, DC. And we're having that experience I was talking about of being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of archival data on their languages. And we're in need of processes, training, and tools to help organize their work moving forward. The tribes we worked with at these workshops have a wide variety of experiences and were in very different places in their archival language revitalization. Some are small, unrecognized tribes. Others um, represent large language departments at federally recognized tribal nations. Some are relying entirely on archival materials for language revitalization as they no longer have first language speakers and others are working to create archival databases to store their ongoing documentation efforts from their fluent speakers that they have today. But what really ties all these communities together is a commitment to language revitalization and also that they see immense value in creating and maintaining digital archives and dictionaries to help their efforts. So at our module two workshops, we trained our participants how to organize and create community curated archives using our ILDA software. They received training in both the archive side and the online dictionary. They also received training in how to perform the background processes necessary to populate an archive, such as transcribing written and audio archival materials using a variety of technical computer processes and software that will allow them to easily import data into ILDA. Another important component we try to always include our, in our work is to engage with communities around the need for solid, short, mid, and long-term project planning to guide their work. So participants also receive basic training in research planning. One aspect of our workshops that I think is really important to note and spans not just these module two workshops, but also the ones in Washington DC is that our participants always emphasize the importance of the opportunity to network and be in community with other native people who are doing language revitalization. The sharing of cultures, experiences, and um, the emotional weight of language work um, brings our participants together and creates lasting relationships and uh, collaborations that yeah, span a, a long periods of time. Um, it makes me remember that one of the effects of colonization on our peoples is to disconnect us not only from our own communities, but also from other native communities around us. Um, I believe our, our workshops and National Breath of Life more broadly is really rooted in what I see as a really indigenous ethic of cross-cultural sharing and solidarity. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just really proud that our participants are able to get that sort of um, feeling and experience from our workshops, and I wanted to mention it. So you'll be hearing more about ILDA this afternoon from Drs. Costa and Lockwood, but I, I wanted to take a minute um, to depart because it's such a focus of what we do at our module two workshop. So just wanna give a quick overview. So as I've mentioned, ILDA stands for the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive. ILDA is a web-based tool built for digital archiving of a given language's archival materials. And it comes paired with a dictionary website and mobile app that can share data with the archive. And this creates a direct pathway from the archival materials to the various contexts of re revitalization, such as the home, community, classroom, et cetera. ILDA has support for written audio and video formats and is continuously being improved based off the needs of our user communities. ILDA is based off the Miami, Illinois Digital Archive or MIDA that was developed by the Miami tribe and the Miami Center 
and is now being shared through National Breath of Life. Um, I wanted to note that software like this is not easy or cheap to develop. And for a lot of communities, it's not realistic or feasible to build custom software tools like this for their efforts. I can't stress enough the level of generosity and care that the Miami Tribe um, and Miami Miamia Center and Miami University are displaying by sharing this tool and the approaches to archives-based revitalization developed through the Miamia revitalization efforts. Making ILDA widely available to communities it, and both financially and institutionally supporting National Breath of Life is incredibly generous. And I consistently hear from our partner communities how grateful they are for your support. And I say this not only as a National Breath of Life employee, but as a person from a community that relies on and benefits from ILDA and the approaches we learned at National Breath of Life every day in our language revitalization. Um, ILDA is designed specifically to enable archives-based language revitalization. Um, that's really key that the software is de designed for rev uh, revitalization. Previous tools were designed for linguistic analysis or linguistic bilinguists for linguists. This is designed for natives by natives. And that means that the structure and functions of the software all point towards eventual return of language from the archive into community use. And we continually strive to keep the goal of community language use in mind whenever we're identifying changes or improvements to the software. I'll just show a couple of screenshots of ILDA. Um, while an ILDA archive can look fairly complex if you've ever logged on to your tribe's site, at its core, the software is doing several basic functions to make archival materials accessible for revitalization. And the first is really just making materials searchable. So once a user community has transcribed their materials, they upload those to ILDA and they're instantly searchable. There are layers of metadata and customization of the search that allow researchers to hone in on needed language to help them create materials for language revitalization. Alongside those transcriptions, users upload digital copies of the original manuscripts, audio files, or videos to be paired with each individual entry. And this ensures that researchers working within ILDA can quickly and easily reference original materials for context and to identify mistakes. For communities with more recent documentation where people have um, strong personal connections to the speakers who provided data, uh, it can really offer descendants the opportunity to engage with their, their relatives' words in a more intimate way. One aspect of working with multiple communities is that each brings with them needs and analysis of the software that can improve it for all the users. So when my team started using ILDA for our language, we needed audio functionality that wasn't in MIDA because a large portion of our materials are audio. So from our need, the Miamia Center added the ability to upload and play audio within ILDA and several communities are using that feature. At the request of one of our recent Workshop 2 communities, we've recently added the ability to put video, um, which will benefit communities doing documentation today. But of course, a archival database is not necessarily the best tool to bring language to the wider community. Um, it can be slow to use and search and a little complicated. So ILDA is mostly used by linguists, teachers, and language researchers to analyze and find create materials, but what is an effective tool for language vitalization is an online dictionary and mobile app. So ILDA comes paired with that. Um, the dictionary has the capability to share data with the archive, so dictionary managers can work with linguists to bring analyzed language over to be accessed by the community quickly and easily in language vitalization contexts. Um, I, We'll leave it to David and uh, Hunter to cover more of ILDA, but wanted to just give a little overview since it's so important to what we're doing. Um, I wanna return to the module two workshops for a minute. So after each of our workshops, we paid attention to communities progress through informal conversations with them. And we also engaged in formal assessment. Um, and we identified several hurdle, hurdles that were standing in the way of communities getting archives up and running. 
So many of the people who come to our workshops are already working full-time jobs, often in language offices or as language teachers, and they don't have time to add this archival work on top of their work duties, despite recognizing how important it is. Many of these communities also lack funding um, to bring in help, new positions to do this work. And finally, we learned that this type of tech Technical training has a lot of small details that are easily in one ear and out the other if you're not continually doing the processes. So what we really identified is that we need to stay engaged with these communities and provide ongoing training and support to them while they establish usable archives and dictionaries and try to help facilitate a planning process for them um, and help them identify future funding opportunities to help them grow into the future. So with all this in mind, we designed the National Breath of Life Apprenticeship Program, which is starting currently through funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Through this program, 10 language communities will identify an apprentice or two apprentices to work with community mentors and National Breath of Life staff over a period of 12 to 24 months on various aspects of archive and or dictionary creation based on their community needs. Each apprentice will be paid um, to work with their mentors and us at National Breath of Life to develop work plans and goals for their time in the program. And they'll receive, receive ongoing support and training from me in archive and dictionary development. Each apprenticeship will look really differently based on the needs and the stage that their community is in. Some will really focus on the background um, typing up or transcription of archival materials, while others will work to create and record audio for online dictionaries. Um, we'll also support our apprentices in that planning process and hope by the end of it, we have solid midterm plans uh, with sources of funding identified that they can apply for. Um, the overarching goals of the apprenticeship program aim to address the limitations that we found in the module two workshops while still building on the strengths and relationships we have with our partner communities. So specifically, we plan to provide support to these communities to help them establish usable and useful archives and or dictionaries for language revitalization. Our hope is that our apprentices gain useful skills and knowledge, as well as integrate with their community's existing revitalization framework in ways that lead to this long-term engagement. And I, I do wanna note here that we do not envision our relationship with these communities ending after the apprenticeship program. Um, we are in a relationship building phase and we really see our work as relationship building. So we're committed to long-term relationships with endangered language communities, and we're gonna continue offering training and support to all the folks we work with. So far, we've identified six communities to participate in the program, and we're um, just getting them onboarded literally this week, next week, um, and we're working to identify four more. And these communities were all selected due to longstanding relationships with us, their desire to use ILDA, their degree of readiness to engage in this type of work. So we're getting that started now. Um, gonna choose four more communities shortly um, and are really looking forward to that. So I know I'm out of time, so I'll uh, rush through our plans for the future. Um, we're really anticipating learning a lot from the apprenticeship program, self-paced program. It's We hope to continue that into the future. Um, we're doing assessment work continually with everything we do so we can continue learning and growing. Um, and maybe we'll just, and I'll pass it to Gabriella for a few thank yous. Yes, I won't even touch anything and I'll stand on my tippy toes. <laughs> I just wanna take a minute to um, acknowledge that the evolution and growth of the National Breath of Life uh, is the result of a large collaborative commitment as you have seen to support the efforts of Native American communities to revitalize their cultures and languages and for the well-being of their members. We're grateful to the Nation National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for innovating within their funding practices to support by way of the National Breath of Life the effort of dozens of communities working on the sustainability of 65 Native American awakening languages. The Miamia Center serves as the institutional home of the National Breath of Life. 
on the occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the relationship between the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University, we want to acknowledge that the institutional stability that the center derives from this partnership also lends stability to the national breadth of life, thereby enabling us to engage with Native American communities with the confidence that we can maintain the commitment uh, in the long term that uh, Jerome just mentioned. We wish to acknowledge as well the commitment of the very communities whose languages are being revitalized. The vision for the future they see for their communities and the commitment to make that future a reality is what energizes us and teaches us how best to think about the national breath of life so that it truly fulfills its mission to grow the forest around us. The relationships that we have built with these communities beautifully exemplifies the concept of Nepuantenki, learning from each other. It is, through that, it is through what we learn about the community's hopes and needs, commitments and visions that we learn how best to strategize the evolution of the national breath of life. And quite importantly, both again, Jerome and I would like to express our deep gratitude to the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma for its leadership and for the generosity with which uh, you have embraced the national breath of life. And I too will not touch anything. <laughs> For the Miamia people out there, this is the stuff that's going on behind the scenes that allows us to get content out of these archives and, and into a platform that you can benefit from. Okay, for our next speaker, we have uh, Drs. Cameron Shriver and Douglas Troy, and they're gonna share a brand new project uh, that they've been working on now for I think close to three years. Um, or stories of the land. Hey, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're glad to be here. My name is Doug Troy. I'm the coordinator of application development. And do you want to introduce yourself, Cam? Hi, Jake. And hey, Nick. I'm uh, Cam, Cam Traver Wayne Zuiani. I'm a historian. So um, <laughs> I'm up here with a, uh, someone who just received a medal from the Miami Nation last night. And so there's, I don't know if what I say will be medal worthy, but I think the project <laughs> is. And so there's a lot of pressure, but uh, we'll let the medal winner go first. Uh, well, that was pretty smooth handing that off to me there, Cam. <laughs> Cam. Um, well, again, um, we're pleased to be here to tell you about um, a new project that we're working on, Achimwakonkonchi, or Stories from the Land. Um, the website address is up there, um, achimwakonkonchi.org. And um, we also want to recognize um, the support of the, of the Miami Tribe, the Amia Center, and uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. Okay, I think I, it's safe to click the clicker, I think, let's see, okay. Okay, I'll just give a brief uh, introduction to the project um, and then Cam and I, I'll tell you more about it. So um, the, the goal of the project is um, to um, support tribes in their um, cultural and, lang and um, language reclamation efforts. So American Indian tribes rely particularly on land rights to establish their rights, strengthen their community, and maintain culture. So Achimwakonkonchi is an interactive historical atlas following the Miami resettlement patterns through Indiana, Kansas, and Oklahoma. So as I mentioned, the goal of the project is to enable tribal members, the public, and current landowner, landowners to access the rich history that define their land over time. Project has uh, been in the process for a while. So we've had uh, team members come and go. So this is kind of a history of uh, people that are currently on the project or were on the project. So um, we have kind of three groups of people, the technology development team, which is my group, 
um, CAM's uh, re historical research team. And then we have a, a mapping team from the uh, GIS department, and we have support from the libraries and um, archives management team. And uh, I should mention Carol Katz, who's our graphics designer for all of our projects. We appreciate Carol's help. So a little bit of the project history. Um, we've been supported over time by several grants, uh, 2012 Historic Preservation Grants, 2014 uh, NPS Grants, and um, our present support from the NEH and all of the uh, Miami Tribe community. So my part of the presentation is just to kind of show you just a quick snapshot of how this project might be, how the project might be used by a tribal member or a member of the community. And then Cam will tell you more about the background and the work that kind of going on behind the scenes supporting the project. So this is an example of the landing page, just the top part of the website. And um, the question here is we have an, um, an ancestor, Mary Wells Walcott, and we wanna know something about where she lived and when she lived. So um, I've typed her name there into the search bar. I hit search and uh, the site comes up with um, a list of the database matches for that person. And uh, in this particular case, there's just one person with that last name, Mary Wells Walcott. And um, if there are more of them, they'd be shown in the list. And if you see a name that you're interested in learning more about, you click it. So you click on that um, bar in the table and the record comes up from our database for the person of interest, in this case, Mary Wells Walcott. So you can see some basic demographic information in there. In this case, we have uh, gender, date of birth, date of death, places, um, a brief biography, um, an image or a photo. And um, there's more information down below. So I'm gonna kind of show you what comes down below, but you can see down at the bottom, there's a list of places related to that person and events related to that person. Um, see what it looks like. If you can read that, you can see that um, her this, there's an event, the uh, Treaty of St. Mary's, and there is a related place, a particular reserve, her reserve, and um, those are links. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, I couldn't put it all on that screenshot, there's a map. So this is where um, our GIS partners come in uh, to support us. Um, but there's a pin there showing where her reserve is located um, in Indiana. And you can scroll, you can uh, scroll around that map, you can zoom in or out. So we're, we're zoomed fairly far out here, but you can see that she's close there to the middle of um, Indiana. Um, back to the top of that page, I mentioned those links at the bottom. If I want to know more about that particular reserve, I can click on that link to the Mary Wells Reserve. And if I want to know more about the story of how that piece of that reserve came about, that 18, um, 18 treaty, I can click on that link. Um, so I clicked on the link on the left, um, her reserve. And this is the top part of what comes up for that record. And this is the kind of the detailed historic land record for that particular reserve. And you can see there's a, a, just a, a transcription that describes um, that piece of land. Um, we've got some other information in there, like the county, the state, um, and in this particular case, we've got a, the, the number of acres associated with that place. Um, there's a tab at the top there called facts. This is the details about the reserve. And there's a, another tab called Timeline, which um, we're, that's a new feature we're working on that'll show you how that piece of land evolved over time. So that's the reserve. Um, going back, um, if I click on the event, that's that 1818 treaty that I mentioned. So this is where I can kind of read more about the story or the details about that piece of land. 
And uh, thanks to Cam's work here, we have a transcription um, of that treaty. Um, each of these records, the event, the place, or the person have the related links down below. In this case, um, we have a link to additional historical documents related to that event. Um, the treaty manuscript from this in, uh, archive, this is external, but this is a public link um, with more information about that treaty. Um, if I go back to that event page and um, there, I can scroll down and see a map of the, all the places related to that event, in this particular case, the Treaty of 1818, these are all of the reserves that uh, came out of that event. So I can click on the polygons or on the places. In this case, I clicked on Mary Wells and it pops up a window with additional links that you can follow to learn more about that place. So you can see here, people related to that event, Mary Wells, that's her reserve. Um, this is a zoomed in version, but an interesting thing about this is if, if you're a community member, you're a Miyamiaki person, you wanna find out what other people lived around Mary Wells. You can scroll around, you can you know, scroll around, pan in on this map. You can click on the other polygons, which are other reserves and find out who lived nearby. So I've clicked on a couple here just to give you a feeling. Um, I can go up to the one just above her reserve. That's Charlie's Ohio reserve. <laughs> and I can kind of scroll down and there's another one, the, the Long Lois Reserve. So that's just one kind of snapshot of how we envision this project might be used by people to learn more about their land, where they came from, where their ancestors came from, and where they lived. Um, one last comment here. Um, we're hoping one of, one of our views in the future is to use some crowdsourcing to get more information from the community about people, places, and events. Um, so this particular person had the bio and the photo contributed by um, a tribal citizen. Um, so I wanted to uh, recognize that as another source of information. So that's just a snapshot of how we hope the site will be used in the future. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Cam um, to talk about kind of where all this information comes from. Anyway, you hear me? Good. So uh, with a little bit of a, um, an overview that you have maybe now, we're, we're just launching this thing um, today, I suppose. I don't know. Um, but um, I want to think maybe holistically about our approaches over the last more or less decade um, to thinking about Miamia land ownership and how to make it useful to people. Uh, so I'm speaking to the people in this room, the Miyamiake in this room and watching. Um, to, this is a reference resource primarily for you. Um, so how well we've done that, I guess, is up for debate. But um, some of the key questions as a historian, um, how can we archive the history of Miami land ownership? Some of the things that I say here, I'm struck by how similar they are with Gabriella and Jerome's, <laughs> what you just heard. How can we archive this incredible, complicated, inaccessible, mass of stuff to make it useful. What do our users expect? How do they use sites like this, maps, archives? And I think more importantly, what do they actually want? And then what's the point of all of it? How can we think about the data in terms of community revitalization, connecting people with lands, with change over time? I think it's easier said than done, even though it's not even that easy to say. Um, but let me give you a, a behind the scenes look at one reserve. So what this database is at the moment is really an archive of real estate. That includes individual and communal reservations in Indiana and Ohio, which began in 1795. 
moving through the treaty process, dozen treaties uh, in the Wabash homelands to Kansas, 300 allotments in Kansas, continuing forward for some community members to 100 or even numbers, 100 allotments in Oklahoma. That's kind of the core um, set of well, lands that we're thinking about at the moment. I'll, I'll come back to that. Let's look at the Longloy Reserve. Reserve listed as reserve number 45. This is my hand. It's the only picture I took of what the data actually looks like in its raw form, which is a stack of uh, trifolded letters, about 70 letters written back and forth from the Longloy family to the Central Bureau in Washington, DC, and filed by clerks. And this is just one two square mile section of Miami land. So you think about the, the history of the land ownership of this continent, uh, the stack of papers would far exceed this building. So based on the 1818 treaty, it's quite clear that uh, Elizabeth Longloy and Peter Longloy, which are just listed as the children of Longloy, uh, we can find out who that is, um, acquire title to this reserve, reserve that's numbered 45 uh, by the Central Bureau, um, General Land Office and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So this is recorded in the Achim Wachiongonje database, which you can find. You can see that uh, their relationship at this moment is that they acquired title to this land, okay? So we're tracking land ownership over time. This is what that reserve look like, looks like in the context of the 1818 treaty. So um, central Indiana is relinquished by the Miami tribe to the United States in this treaty. And in the process, Miami individuals retain or reserve certain sections of land for families, for the nation and for individuals. So this is often colloquially called the big Miami reserve here in the center uh, around Kokomo, but on the, um, on the Ponce au Pichu River, uh, the Wildcat Stomach River uh, is where the Longlois take their land. This is mapped. So thinking about the context of these places in relations with other places and people, this is that one piece of land put in the context of all land transactions that the Miami nation engaged in as a community, including out in Kansas and Oklahoma. So if you're interested in that kind of context. If we zoom in to that reserve, I want to use this slide to, to highlight a feature that people might be um, expecting and hopefully that, that I use a lot, which is um, that you can choose different layers and base maps based on what you want to discover about the place. So as you're driving along, if you want to know the name of a road and exactly where your ancestors reserve started, you can find that out. Uh, if you want to see something about the ecology, we can begin to add those layers to reference, um, let's say, the names of river names based underneath a layer of land ownership, for example. So this is the Longloy Reserve uh, zoomed in. This is um, in Lafayette, Indiana, right near Purdue University, across the river. And one way that this might be used, I was talking to Gene Richerville yesterday, and the reason I was late to breakfast is because I was trying to find an answer. Uh, and she, I think you were wondering about the Richerville allotments and where they were in relation to more or less the places that you know in Oklahoma. Um, and so this is a zoom in. I just typed in Richerville, looked for Oklahoma, and I thought you were interested in Catherine Richerville. If I'm wrong, well, the other Richardvilles are right there anyways, so you can find them. But I've, I just clicked on this piece of land. You can see that as you go past the nation's council, uh, council house and powwow grounds, grounds, which are this circle here, uh, kind of takes this dog leg to the right, and right on your left is Catherine's uh, old allotment. Um, right to the north, if, I, if this was active on the screen, I would click on this polygon, a shape, and see that that's, I believe, Hannah Richardville, right to the north. I think Mary Richardville on this polygon. I think Charles Woodson Richardville, uh, right there. So you could click on that, and again, notice that you could 
click on the place to learn the meets and bounds or the, the description of the survey of the land, um, as well as you can click on uh, the 1889 allotment and see all of them, there are 100, uh, or click on the person's name and you will bring up Megan Dory's um, biography of that person and any associated pictures that were in that allotment booklet that all the tribal citizens were given. So it's just kind of an interactive version of the allotment book. If you're aware of the allotment booklet, I, I like that and I wanted to digitize it. Okay, going back to the hand picture. I should recognize that I took this picture with uh, Doug Pakangi and I went to National Archives to document uh, all of these pages. Through an intense <laughs> a process of labor using student laborers um, paid for by, uh, I believe, the Miami tribe and the National Endowment for the Humanities, potentially. Um, they have uh, extracted metadata from all of these thousands, uh, something like 3,000 pages of handwritten manuscripts to identify who are the people being talked about putting them in some chronological order or an order that you could move them around depending on what you're looking for. And so these 70 um, pages of letters, which are essentially disputes over who actually owns that land, um, which is complicated, are put into a, a software called Content DM, which is an archiving software. So this would be called, this is a digital surrogate of those physical documents. So trying to make them a little bit accessible to people so you can actually flip through them and read them. So they're digitally archived. Once we've digitally archived all of those letters and figured out what exactly they're saying, which again is a Herculean task for just this one reserve, this one Longloy family who is Miamia, uh, they keep their land in, in Miamia hands well into the 20th century. And so I haven't, I don't know exactly what happens to each piece of this land, but this is how they map it out over the course of many, many generations. So it remains in Miami hands, parceled off, sold off, very, very piecemeal. Not the entire allotment sold, but I don't know, at least dozens and dozens of land sales, parcels, splits, wills, splitting up amongst seven grandchildren, that kind of thing. Um, so this is what those documents look like if you map them in space. A canal goes through the land. They have to deal with a canal company. They have to deal with a railroad company. They have to deal with a, uh, if memory serves, a gravel road company. The Wildcat and something gravel road, which is uh, filling these pages. So in sum, looking at just this one reserve, um, we've attempted to make it accessible in different ways and relative to other things. Accessible in terms of you can read the documents, which are difficult to read, which are in Washington, DC, where I do not live, making the map accessible so you can move around and browse and click on things, interactive, and then entering all that information into a usable archive, which is databased so that you can find it again and search it and browse it and do the things that we expect websites to do, <laughs> at least archive websites. And I didn't have much room there, but the, uh, the labor involved is immense. This is not automated. <laughs> Maybe that's the next step, train a computer to do it. Yeah. So this is really early days for this site, for this process. We've only done step, well, I don't know, I don't wanna say step one, but we've only entered the treaties and allotments. The next question that I'm really interested in digging into is what actually happens once those allotments are granted to Miami individuals, reserved by Miami individuals, um, how do, what do they do with it and how do they relinquish it or hold on to it over generations? We are not there yet, <laughs> despite many years into this. Um, so just with the treaties and the allotment events um, in the you know, 1800s, 1900s, um, 
those treaties involve just in themselves over 550 individuals that all need to have names and unique IDs and births and deaths and to the extent we can. Um, involving 581 places that are reserves or allotments that are kept by the Miami nation as a whole or Miami individuals or Miami families. And the Content DM Digital Archive, which is the, the thing that holds those digital surrogates, has over a thousand pages at the moment and many more that are being prepared to be uploaded. These are my nerd slides. They're not as beautiful as the Breath of Life slides, but I think they're trying to say the same thing, which is, <laughs> which is how do you go from acquiring archival data to actually using it? Like that is, that is hard. Uh, how do you collect it, catalog it, arrange it, retrieve it? Um, what, is, what, are the, what, is, what are the archives that you want to collect to make usable? I mean, I think there's an opportunity here for oral histories and personal knowledge from living people. I don't want to uh, settle for just old documents in Washington, DC, but what are your memories in this specific place? And how can we record those if you want to share them so that some second cousin in Oregon can learn from you? I think educational education people call that peer to peer learning. <laughs> My college is community. So all of this background ends up over years in kind of the public site, which is based around a data set of people who are related to places, who are related to events that change those places and people. It doesn't have to be just treaties, but based on land ownership, that's what we focused on so far. It's the most accessible, seems important to people. What land is being transacted? Now that we have this tool, I'm interested to see what comes out of it. I have ideas. But well, you do too. What layers and maps do you want to see produced over the next year, five years, 10 years? I'm good at promising things or explain. I am not going to make these maps, but we can translate these to the map makers, the GIS people. Genealogy, I think, is something that I have heard from a lot of community members to learn about their ancestors. What's very um, Exciting about this is that this is, the, this is a unique data set that allows extensive research across time and space. Um, in other words, it's big data, which takes a lot of time, but I, I think there are interesting questions that we could ask from it. And for each of these points of entry, whether you're interested in people, whether you're interested in places or events, you can both browse and search those. So this is an architecture that's built to be big enough for a community's kind of needs and wants. And now we, uh, we're in the process of filling those rooms, but I think there's some wiggle, there's some, there's some things that we can do in different rooms of that, of that house to, um, to make it useful. One of the things that I always wanted was to be able to interrogate big data. So this is an example of something that I could do theoretically which no one else can do. I mean, no other community can do. Other people can follow, can do what I do. Um, what if I wanted to know all the female allottees in Kansas? I could click female Kansas allottees. Those are people who receive land in Kansas in the allotment process. Boom, it would give me a list. I could add age at allotment. I could, I could look at whether eventually whether, whether a river runs through it. And I would have this very intricate data set um, to understand the price of women's land sales near rivers. Um, and I wouldn't be able to put that in context of anything else because no, one, no other communities I think have that big data set to, to compare it to. But maybe you could look at how does that compare to Oklahoma 
a generation or two later, something like that. I've been talking about data, and I wanted to return to something that um, Dr. Wesley Leonard mentioned on Thursday, which is, as he put it, we've been mined enough. And so taking, uh, borrowing an idea from my colleague, Robin Abbott, who's our geography head, GIS coordinator, she said something I think really wonderful and beautiful, which is we're not doing this for the people in the black and white photos. We're doing it for our colleagues in the colored photos. And so I hope that I'm a, I can talk about data in this context because this is a room filled with the people in the colored photos, living, breathing people um, to, to review this. But in a different context, I think it would be much more important to think about how, is this, how can this be used or is it used by living and breathing people today? So that, that's an open question. It's not all about real estate. <laughs> That's something that we focused on. But we're also digitizing and making useful, hopefully, other data sets, such as cultural ecologies, place names. So, kind of uh, some of the developments that we're working on are exciting, I think, and if we have um, the ability to, to share this, I'll, I'll attempt to do it. But um, we've also um, made available more place names, which I think, which is very different <laughs> from what I've been talking about. But I think, you know, it's, I'm just kind of thinking out, out loud about you know, what do people actually want from a map or an archive? And so you could zoom to, uh, we've kind of categorized loosely um, categories of places such as towns or minotena, towns, minotena, um, public cemeteries, historical ecologies like the Black Swamp, um, rivers, and other things that we have or want names for. And so if I can zoom in enough, the interrelation between tools is something that's um, I'm going to play this, and it might be very quiet or very loud or not play at all. So we've connected a map with language um, so that theoretically you can browse starting with a place and it'll take you to the dictionary and kind of the exploration or browsing your curiosity might, mm, there might be answers to your curiosity, <laughs> um, hopefully. Um, and so the place names that are in here um, are accessible through the dictionary as well. So I hope that you have ideas and come talk to me or someone <laughs> about, uh, about your ideas and what, you're, what you'd be interested in. Um, we're continuing to develop the database, which is the, the website, um, to make it usable to fix bugs and identify new features that might be useful. Uh, there's a lot of development ongoing with maps. Fortunately, we have a wonderful GIS coordinator and support for graduate assistants who are our technicians and cartographers. Um, research has um, taken a step, or taken a, has, has stopped for the moment while we collect things and make them useful and digitize them. Um, we're interested in crowdsourcing. 
what you're willing to share. We have feedback um, on the site that you can leave messages. You can, you can actually upload photos and images of places. So maybe some things that you might be interested in are, if you wanna share, pictures of people that are listed here or not listed here, pictures of places. We don't have many pictures of places, but if you, if you are in a place, you could take a, theoretically, a selfie of an allotment and it could go up there to connect humans to the land, reconnect humans to the land, keep humans connected to the land. We wanted to say thank you to the Miami Nation, Mission Newe, and to the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting this. Mission Newe. So the, the audio files on that presentation are connected to the ILDA dictionary. So that's a really wonderful example and what I was getting at in my introduction, how these various projects start to weave and interconnect behind the scenes to share data across the different platforms. It's kind of exciting to be able to do that uh, for the first time. We're a couple of minutes ahead, so I don't want to rush too uh, quickly on this, but our next speaker is Dr. Michael Ganella. Mike has been involved with our work for many, many, many years. I uh, will ask him to just take a few minutes and uh, just kind of talk about his connection to this place, uh, to the tribe and, and the long work that he's done that is now culminating into something that's pretty exciting for us. And this will be the last presentation uh, before lunch. So. Uh, if you need to take a break, maybe now would be a good time. Uh, we'll take a few minutes before we actually get started so we're closer to the online time.
Using the clicker. Oh, that's live. And you can just forward and back pretty straight forward. And it has a laser pointer. But yeah, I'm not completely useless because, yeah. I can so. point at people, but I can't yeah. That's Jonathan. That's Dave. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's fun for me to see this because having all of those numbers really good in the background connectivity. Awesome. We've never had that ability to connect one archive to another and start sharing this. It's been a good education for me, too. Yeah. All these if I help you kind of understand in the continued development of this one, now I see the bigger picture. Yeah, cool. 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 Want me to get your attention? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. Sorry. I swear that's louder than it was this morning. Hi. Uh, my name is Mike Canella, and I'm going to be I'm presenting on um, the new ethnobotanical database that I've been helping develop, uh, Maki Kiwa. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history first, as we all are. Um, so I began my graduate work here at Miami in 2001. And um, through previous work, I'm from California, and through previous work uh, with the Forest Service in California, I got linked up with um, some native communities there that were doing harvesting and gathering on, the, on the, the national forest I was working in. And I just got interested in that. Um, so when I, um, my wife drug me to live in Cincinnati and I start, started graduate school uh, here at Miami, I was interested in doing ethnobotanical work, but um, I wasn't really sure how I would do that. But I was fortunate to get a, uh, an email, um, Daryl, Baldwin had just started his Miamia project work here at the university and was looking for some assistance um, with some um, of the plant knowledge that he was uh, learning and or had known and, and we were trying to decide what to do with it. Um, and that's when the earliest database started, kind of took off like, um, so I basically am, have learned that I, um, I, with the, the Miamia tribe, the Miamia community, I've basically been a, a gatherer of plant knowledge, someone who came along and could help just gather the knowledge where it was learned or where it was found and organize it. Um, and I'm really good at organizing things, so I really enjoyed building this database. But um, from these lists of different plant terms um, that, that came from different historic sources, and plant use information and some information that was came out of the language research um, from Dr. David Costa, uh, Microsoft Access Database was created. This looks a little different than my copy. And here is my version, um, Dr. Shriver said um, his nerd slide. This is uh, my uh, plant nerd slide, but it really is an, um, I consider myself more an ecologist than a botanist in some ways because this is the, the Microsoft Access, a screenshot of the database, and it's just all this information. I tried to put as much possible information, the fields for that information to house it as we learn. So it was some of it, a lot of it was Miamia plant use knowledge, cultural um, uses of the food uses, medicine uses, things like that, things that I learned and gathered together um, but there's also other things there too, um, listed on this screenshot. And um, I, I don't know why I choose bright green as the background when I made this database. But um, there's a description of the plant, there's the habitats that it's found in, um, the, the type of Miamia uses, the categories. And again, don't spend too much time trying to figure out what's on here because this is the first one that just tried to include everything. And that is partly um, the, the ecologist perspective that I have. You know, each plant isn't just an individual being, it's connected to so many other things that define it, which really now I can see that that's useful because it really is more of a Miamia perspective on um, living things in the natural world too. So, um, what I did was gather sources of Miamia plant knowledge from historic documents, um, as I mentioned, 
Also from the Miami, uh, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma's archives, there were documents, recorded interviews and just discussions among relatives. And um, then I also started just going to as many tribal events as I could and talking to people and writing down the plant knowledge and putting it into this, the kind of crude, exhaustive database that was the first one. And we, um, at some point a few years ago, um, with discussions mostly with Terrell, and, um, but, and as ILDA came, became more um, live and used and developed, we saw that there was a need for something less cumbersome than that other database, than that, the access database. Something like slim it down to the things that um, people really would be, use, would be useful for people. So community members could access it and learn about um, different types of um, uses of plants, maybe where they're harvested or just background on them. And that's when this Makikiwa was um, started to be developed. And this is the homepage of that site. And it has, um, right now it's just kind of getting up and going. And for me, I was just saying to, to um, Daryl that it's been a good education for me to, to look at the other websites and realize there's so much connectivity between them. So this also has connectivity to the ILDA dictionary and archive. Um, this one now has, a, well, let's show you a little bit of it. Slim down version, more user friendly um, of the original database, things that people would really want to know. And new information is coming in from, from ILDA too, and from new document translations, transcriptions. I get new plant knowledge and I'll find the place where I think it best goes or places and um, try to always keep thinking of the audience, which is the, the, the Yamiya community. Eventually scholars too could use it too, um, but that's mostly what, what it's about. Um, yeah, this is a, a different version <laughs> of my talk. So there's a lot of slides that I, I'm, I don't have. Um, let me kind of just go on by verbally telling you about it. Yeah, what you're seeing here is just the first iteration. So we've just got about 20 to 25 species input and uploaded into this. And a process of them becoming public is not to be um, controlling or secretive. It's that we want the information that's put out there to be the most accurate that we can. We can. Uh, mostly focused on, I'd say, the accuracy of the Miamia terms and then also the knowledge that's inherent in that's being presented. So what um, maybe all good um, ethnographers do, and I'm sort of one, is uh, write down or record what is the information that's presented and um, do it in a way that's as unbiased as possible. And I think that's one of the, the things that, I, um, that I'm behind on this new database is that the um, the information on the plants is, is um, presented um, as is. So as the recorder, it could have been um, a, historic, a historian or a lieutenant colonel in the French army or um, a Jesuit missionary or a Miamia person uh, that's alive now or is no longer alive, whatever, however they were recorded, that's how it's presented in the database. So I'm not, you know, and when I, when I first created the first database in Access, there were, um, I, I, want, I tended to summarize what was said and kind of like the plant uses, cultural uses of plants. And in this second go around, I realized, well, that's kind of adding bias onto bias because every single ethnographer, every person that records someone else's something, whatever they say or do, it, it gets a little skewed. It's like that game telephone. And so if I wrote kind of what I thought they meant on top of what this, Jesuit missionary thought they meant the Miamia people, then it's, you know, we're losing a little bit more. So what we see um, in the database now or what people will see is exactly what was written, even if it was, it, you know, kind of offensively biased. You know, the word savage is used a lot by the Jesuit missionaries and some um, historians and 
and they'll say what they thought because they were writing to people. Some of these um, explorers were writing um, about the Miami culture and to write back to Europe where they came from and were funded by. So it, it really becomes quite skewed. So what you'll see when you use this database or the users will see is just um, whatever is there, whatever was recorded. And again, with that original potential bias, but the, now it, it allows the user, which is a community member, to do their own self-interpretation um, of what, what that cultural knowledge is, that plant use was or is. So, and I think that's, that's really important that it, it, we have kind of a more, and that really is how the, the, the plant knowledge has evolved too, is it's a community of people with differing opinions and differing practices and views that's, that's how it is. And it kind of gets away from a static look at the Miami plant knowledge. It's fluid, it still is today. Um, so I'm not able, well, maybe I could try accessing the actual website. Uh, tech help? <laughs> I can try, but hmm. Huh. Look at that, they're doing it for me. <clears throat> Can you log in for me or should I? Oh. I don't give this out. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> nope. Too many people in the room to remember. There we go. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's browse. <laughs> so here we have a list. And um, again, this isn't something that everyone would see. Um, not that it's secret, but there are a list of plants. You can go by, choose the letter that the, the scientific name starts with. And uh, we could try common names too. I am just realizing people might know those better. Um, and some of them are, have a, a green check. That means they're approved. That means that they have gone through the process of we've made sure that the information is accurate as possible and it's cleaned up and um, that the Miamia term associated with that plant is as accurate as we, it's, it's good to go. And um, I'm gonna give an example of, oops, the plant I'm, familiar with, Leninja or Asclepius syriaca, common milkweed. And here's what you would see, um, a little bit of just the basic information about the plant, but then under here, Miamia archival sources, this is where you would, where are listed all the different records um, of that plant. And by record, that's the you know, ethnographic way of just saying some information that was recorded about that plant by somebody at some point. It could be a, a Miamia person, or it could be someone that um, recorded it that was from an outside source. Um, some of it is from published resources, books and things, um, and some of it goes back, some of it like ar the archival information, like this one. But this one particularly has a lot of information in it because there, there was a lot of knowledge within the community and there still is about this plant. And some of the information I recorded myself, some of the information in here is from people that are sitting in the room that I, I spoke with and I wrote it down and I put it in here. Oh, just so you know, I'll, I'll do questions at my table after the talk, thanks. So there's one thing to look at. There's some other interesting things in here. Um, there are some resources. If you would like, you can look at a bibliography of all the sources of information that were used in the last 20 years of gathering Miami plant knowledge. That is there. Um, 
There are also, one of the things I like here is these legends, which just um, actually defines the, how I use terms in there. So again, I, um, I'm one person, I'm not a Miamia tribe member, and I am working with the tribe and the community, but I came up with definitions kind of from the botanical point of view of, uh, or, or ethno, there's a lot of ethnobotanists out there that are non-indigenous people. And they came up with categories of plant uses for indigenous people, like customary use, customs, food, material uses, technology, medicinal. So what I did is I tried to refine those with, with working with the Miamia Center and people um, that know more about it than I do, know more about the culture. Um, but um, also being really explicit here, here's the definitions we're using of how those uses were categorized um, and you can like it or not. And, and I like that it's uh, so transparent because this is a very iterative community type of knowledge and it, um, it, it's important for everyone to have a say. When it's transparent, then everyone has a voice in it and that's how the, the knowledge is evolving. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of trying to force Miamia plant knowledge into a Western science category, into a database, which is very structured into all these categories, when it really, in my, from my experience, is all about relationships. These, the plants, the relationships with the people and the plants and the plants with the plants and the soil and everything. And that kind of richness um, is hard to do in like a, a, a digital thing. Um, but it gets at it, you know, it's getting closer as I see all the connections made between the different, um, the different databases too. So, and again, this information is um, another use, I think, of this database is that it is a, a sounding board. Um, and I'll give a quick little anecdote um, from my own background. Um, I, I lived a year in, in Guatemala and I was there to do, um, to help this the Kekchi indigenous culture kind of recover from 39 years of civil war. They had lost a lot of their agricultural practices. I shouldn't say lost. This is not the group to say lost in. Um, they, they stopped doing them for a while. They paused and that was from cultural trauma. And what I was there to do was to um, help, um, help the nutrition of the people by growing nutritional crops, the ones that they stopped growing because they were fleeing violence. And I, I created a small, um, a couple acre demonstration garden of, for nutritious plants and um, tried to, I was pretty new to the intercultural work and I you know, brought all these seeds down uh, from the United States when I moved down there and of uh, plants that were high in vitamin A and iron and, and said, here's the foods you need to grow, you know, so your health is better because um, I had the answers. Um, and it didn't really work. After about a year, um, people would come to the demonstration garden and, and look, and mostly the campesinos would come and they would look and they'd be talking and kind of pointing at me like, and, and, uh, and I realized the whole value of that was, um, well, one of my friends said, I had, to, I had to play the fool. I had to, what I did was I, I gave them a reason to start talking to each other. They said, we don't do it like that. We don't grow that plant. We don't grow it that way. But the, they started talking. They started, uh, some energy came back into their, their, their um, more traditional ways that they would, they would farm. And I see that this database somewhat like that, and this is again, just kind of my opinion, but that it is a sounding board. Here's all the information that I gathered. It's there as um, bare and naked as it I could, you know, we can present it and as accurate. Now, hopefully people will start talking about what they do. You know, I, I talked to enough family, Miamia family members or families to know that one family harvests Leninja one way, another family harvests a little bit different way. And sometimes some of those families would say like, no, we don't do it that way. You know, that's just, that's just normal, you know, any kind of, idea that there's some one way and you know that's that's a, a very false presentation and i think this allows people to have discussions and have diversity and have evolution of that knowledge
another uh, interesting aspect of this, and let me try to pull up this one species for you. But it's uh, another strength of the database is that it is a placeholder for knowledge. I've already kind of touched on that, but there are some there's some plant knowledge that isn't really complete that we haven't learned enough for it to be complete. There's a plant called colic root. I don't have a picture, so maybe it doesn't really matter to pull it up or not. Um, but we don't, we have a little bit of information that it was used as an antidote to poison and a snake bite remedy, but we don't know a lot about it. We're not sure that's exactly what that, um, the information recorded was talking about that species. So again, Western science, you know, we're trying to like draw one line between two things. That species must do this. It doesn't always work like that. Um, but also just this database, we're holding that knowledge in a place. And as other information is learned, maybe through ILDA and um, who knows where else, sometimes other regional tribes that shared similar landscape to the Miamia or share similar landscapes. Uh, there might, some information might come from that too, to fill in that picture. And we'll get, a, uh, until then, the database is a place to have that where you can finally put all those pieces together. Some of you out there, I know pe some people can really hold all these different pieces in their mind well, like my wife, and put it, synthesize it in their head. I can't do that. Um, so I think the database really seems like that's a strength to me too, that it can do that for us. We can see it all in one place. And that is about all I wanted to share on that. And I'm happy to field questions out at my table, but uh, appreciate the funding from the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma for the, this continued work. And um, Nishinewe. Mishinewa, Nika. <laughs> All right, we're um, a little bit early, so I want to encourage you to spend some time at the speaker tables. Um, all of our speakers that are that are here, if you can be present at your tables. And um, a couple of quick announcements. If you haven't looked outside, it's actually snowing. <laughs> so, you know, on some years, the weather's decent. People will want to walk uptown. We give you a very generous break for lunch, uh, but many of you may not want to walk uptown in the snow. Um, there are several places downstairs that, that are opened. I would encourage you to, to take a look at uh, what's available downstairs. It is cashless, so just know that if you're going to try to eat downstairs, uh, you'll need a, a credit card uh, to, to do that. Um, there's also an exhibit over in the art building, and that should be in your packet. So if you have a little extra time and you want to wander over there, that's basically right across the street. Um, it's not far from here. And then also the Wikiami room, which is just below us here. If you haven't visited that for a while, um, we've got some new uh, imagery on the exterior wall. And I believe the cases have been redone. So um, otherwise, uh, take some time, visit. Miami people like to visit, so we didn't want to load you up too much with presentations. And we will see you back here promptly at 1.30. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
Test, test. Check. I'll make sure. Ellie, check. Ellie, check. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. That's, that's working really well now. I think it's even picking up my voice here. Yeah, it is. Um, you want me to mute it? Yeah, go ahead.
Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Good. Anyway. Hiya, Chaky. Whoa. Hiya, Chaky. I guess they turned it up while we were on lunch. Mission Day, we're off. We appear. Thank you for returning. I trust that you all found uh, something enjoyable to do during your lunch, whether it was visit or eat or both. All right. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a quick announcement. All the Miamia tribe alumni that can hear me after we're done with this conference, um, we're going to meet outside for a big picture, not outside in the snow, outside the room. <laughs> so if you could kind of stay back a little bit and then I'll have a designated location uh, when we announce the end. So. All right, well, the first part of our program was pretty heavy in archive development and we're gonna switch gears a little bit, um, touching on the relationship and also uh, learning from our students. You know, we, our students come here to learn, but what many of them don't really realize is how much we learn uh, from their experiences. So. I, I think you'll enjoy that uh, that presentation as well. So to get us started, we all tehe yangwe ne pondi yangwe, learning from each other. That's the phrase that we're using to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And we have uh, Kara Strauss and uh, uh, Dr. Shriver back for a second round. <laughs> you'll be done right after this one. I promise. Right. <laughs> I won't ask anything of you more today. Missionary. Place names on the map of this region, they smolder like embers of old campfires. The Little Miami River, the Great Miami River, Miami County, Maumee River. This place, that's something that my grandfather said in 1991. He was talking to Turtle Berkey Bile. He was talking to Rachel Hall. He was talking to Tina Holen and some of their parents. He said that he had heard that from a historian named Walter Havinghurst, who wrote the history of this university in the 1950s. When I think that statement was true, the only connection between people was a name, and it was just an ember. Thinking a lot about embers and fires this weekend. I don't think that Walter Havinghurst knew about Miami County, Indiana. I don't think he knew about Miami County, Kansas. I don't know if he knew about Miami, Oklahoma. For the settlers here, it was the name. Not a lot of heat with those embers. But in the last 50 years, people blew. It took a long time. Well, it took 50 years, but here we are. And we benefit from the heat and the warmth and the light of that fire. And it wasn't always like this. So with the benefit of standing here now, I want to look back to think about what is worth celebrating. I'm a historian, so I'm going to go way back. Long time in the history of this university and not so long in the history of the Miyamiake. I want to talk about land, something I don't know we talk much about in the context of the relationship the founding of this university. I'm gonna talk about what we think of as the origin story 50 years ago in 1972, what was actually happening in 1972. And that's all a setup for us here in this room, which is, I think a story of 
creating space on this landscape for Miamia people, and we call that self-determination. So I want to plant that. All American universities were, were built on native land. What does that mean for us here? Well, the short answer is that the Miami tribe, the Miami nation was an unwilling benefactor of Miami University. The primary source of revenue of old Miami from 1809 to 1873 was rent from this land. Not tuition, there was no state assistance. It was rent from the land. The ink was barely dry on the Constitution of the United States in the 1780s when the United States embarked on a war of conquest to uh, gain this land called the Mishamalsa Wars, the wars against the Americans. If you're from this region and you've ever heard of these wars, you might call them the Northwest Indian Wars or Little Turtles War. It took a lot of blood and treasure to wrest this territory from the indigenous owners ending with the Treaty of Greenville in 1795, just north of here. On that day, the Miami signers relinquished their ownership of the place where we're sitting right now. So the Miami and Shawnee people relinquished their land to the United States federal government who flipped it to the Board of Trustees of Miami University who own it today. Very simple chain of title. And I'm interested in chain of titles if you were here earlier. So Miami University was initially not an uh, institute of learning, but a land company, more or less. They owned the board of trustees, owned 36 square miles called a township. It's called the college township. And this is what it looks like on the land on a modern map. It was called the college township until it became Oxford Township. And they would rent that out. They began selling land in 1810 at the Hamilton, Ohio courthouse. Um, people would pay for their area of land and then they were required to pay 6% of the value of that land to the board of trustees. It was collected from a collector, which was a position on the, on the university board of trustees. They had a secretary, a president, treasurer, and a collector who wandered around collecting. This is the first one. This guy, Alexander King, owes every year $1 and seven mills. <laughs> Tiny little cents, I guess. Less than cents. Revenues increased. Um, as I said, most revenues of old Miami are from the land until the school closed and reopened with state assistance after, uh, as a result of the Civil War, and so in the late 19th century. Miami University made in the 18 teens between $1,000 and $2,000 a year from the land, these 36 square miles, the Oxford College Township. 23,000 uh, acres is what that township is, more or less. So they earned eventually, um, once everywhere was settled within the township, the price rose to kind of $5,000 to $7,000 every year was the, what they received for 23,000 acres. In the 18 teens, the Miami nation had relinquished 23 million acres, more than 23,000 acres, and received a similar amount of money every year. About the same money every year for 23 million acres versus 23,000 acres. 23 million acres is about the size of Indiana. So the land was plundered, and I'll return to that later. The land was then privatized beginning in 1959. Initially, the land was going to be, according to the law, the General Assembly of uh, the great state of Ohio had decided that the land would be reappraised every 15 years to allow land values to increase and therefore revenues to increase. Quickly thereafter, for whatever reason, the General Assembly decided they wouldn't reappraise the land and people had entered uh, leases 
to hold their land for 99 years, beginning in 1810. The land was not reappraised, so you were paying the same rent to the university in 1810 as you did in 1910 or 1909, technically. And then those leases were renewed for 99 year, years more. What that meant was that as land values increased here, people continued to pay the same very suppressed prices, which meant that the university was not receiving much money from the land anymore compared to the, the budget, annual budget of the university. The budget of the university is much more than $7,500, which was kind of the max amount that the, that the university could acquire. So they lobbied for legislation and began privatizing. People could buy out of selling, of leasing their land every year. They didn't have to go to the window and pay a dollar or two dollars every year. They could buy out for $25. And so most of the land has now been totally privatized when it didn't benefit the university. The land built Harrison Hall called Old Main. It helped build Stoddard and Elliott Halls. Not only literally the bricks from the land, but the money to hire brick makers. So both the land physically and the money from the land. When Alumni Library was built in the 1900s, a new library called Alumni Library because alumni donated to help build it. Andrew Carnegie, who is not an alumni, but loved libraries. Um, paid for a lot of it, and land rent paid for alumni library as well, partially. This is one example of someone's land rent in 1955. Big old boxes in the university archives tracking people's land. That's one story. Another story that we point to is 1972, when Forrest Olds, from, from our perspective in Oxford, mysteriously popped into campus. I don't know if he was a mysterious man, but that's kind of the way that we talk about it. This is a photo of John Ruthven, a wildlife painter who, uh, I think the only humans that he ever depicted were native people. He made this, he did research uh, consulting with Boy Scouts to determine what uh, Native people might have looked like and came up with, with this, which is Miami Indian One. And from this, this, this is so important to the relationship, I think, because this becomes the logo, the, the brand identity of the university for a long time. And this is what people point to as a moment when Miami Indians said, this is, this is us for that moment. Nineteen seventy two, Chief Olds didn't pop in so mysteriously, although it wasn't a planned visit. Um, I want to think about the context of the nineteen seventies, first from the university and then from Oklahoma. I mean, university was dealing with the Vietnam War, as all of the United States and other places in the world, including Vietnam were. Um, the Rowan Hall takeover in 1970 was still um, a hot topic on campus. Rowan Hall is just down the stairs. This picture would have been taken just down these stairs when the Rowan Hall, the ROTC building, was taken over by students, uh, ending in tear gas in the spring of 1970. Soon thereafter, Kent State, four students, um, shot dead at Kent State and like other universities, Miami University closed. Hundreds of universities closed. At the same time, there were committees to diversify Miami University, which are ongoing. Committees to diversify campus, particularly African-American faculty and students. I mean, the first tenure track fac African-American faculty member, Heenan Wilkins, is 1968. First African-American staff member at this university is So They create ad hoc committees to investigate how we can improve campus as they continue to do. And one of those was brought to the president's desk in 1972. It was a student government 
resolution to change the race based mascot of the nickname, the nickname of the athletic teams, which began with an R. And so the president created an ad hoc committee to investigate the use of that nickname. Pointed seven people. One was a former high wabop dancer, danced around at half times. Outfit was created by uh, predominantly Boy Scouts. And he said, it was with great excitement and trepidation, he recalled in 1993, that I telephoned him that same day to discuss the relationship and whether to, it's quite a dichotomy, to continue our warm bond of historical heritage or to terminate it forever. Those are the options. Cold embers. That's what he remembered in 1993. He had to call some agency. I guess he got in touch with the Bureau of Indian Affairs because he didn't know that there was a Miami tribe. I mean, he, re he remembered that. And they told him, yeah, there's folks out in Oklahoma. Okay. He called him. In what ways is our university's nickname harmful to you? They wrote to Chief Olds. And he began literally first line. First of all, I am not a militant, and therefore my ideas may not coincide with militant thinking, which is interesting. <laughs> they weren't asking about that, I don't think. So what's the context? I think the context that both, university, uh, both the university and the nation are thinking through is activism. In the case of Oklahoma and Indian country, that's called red power often. He's saying, that ain't me. <laughs> University folks, as well as those in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, knew about the 1960s Northwest Fissions, the takeover of Alcatraz, it was nightly news, 1969-1970, using the national media. While they were corresponding in the summer of 1972, there was a convoy, the Trail of Broken Treaties, that was coming across the, the nation descending coming to Washington, D.C., that ended up taking over the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, which is the photo on the left. And so when I think about um, the, the siege at Wounded Knee in 1973, which was also front page news here and there, when I think about red power and the American Indian movement, I think of red berets and jean jackets and rifles, black braids, and those aren't the image, that's not the image of Chief Olds that I have gathered from the record. Think about overalls, he's a farmer. Think about nice suits, beaded bolo, walking cane. First of all, I am not a militant. Chief Olds was a uh, member of the National Congress of American Indians. And the National Congress of the American Indians responded to red power with a a banner on their headquarters that said, Indians don't demonstrate. I want to connect the dots a little bit differently. And I think what's important in this context, come back to land, is the Indian Claims Commission, which is a procedure to investigate historical injustices and make financial restitution for unjust treaties. It begins in the 1940s and ends in the 1970s. Long process. The Miami tribe is actively involved in this process throughout, bringing claims against the federal government for past injustices, treaty injustices, legal wrongs. Olds was working with, Chief Olds was working with Chief Forrest Olds, if I haven't said his first name, uh, Metekia, called Pude, Pude, was working with lawyers from a, a Chicago law firm, um, a high-powered law firm. He was traveling to Washington, D.C. somewhat frequently, writing to politicians, not low-level politicians, not universities, but senators. He was, being invited to pre he was being invited to presidential functions. That is, not Miami University presidential functions, although there's that too, but, you know, United States presidential functions. For example, uh, in 1966, Forrest Olds visited Indiana and Ohio, and he wrote something beautiful. I have a better understanding as to why 
<clears throat> I now have a better understanding as to why my ancestors were so reluctant to leave this place of fertile land and beautiful streams. Chief Folds was an activist, maybe, for his nation at least. Treaty of 1805, as one example, the United States government agreed that the Miami nation had received just 1.3% of fair market value at that time, and that docket was awarded in 1969. 1809, think about the founding of this university in 1809, we're 13 miles from the international border. You can ride your bike to Treaty Line Road from here. As far west as you can go until you're in Namyonge. Treaty of 1809, the U.S. agreed the, the Miami Nation had received 1.1 and 0.6% of fair market value. That was also awarded in 1969. So what is Chief Olds doing in the early 1970s? He's writing very pointed letters to his politicians. Dear Senator Harris, Fred Harris, a Democrat from Oklahoma, thanks very much for introducing bill for distribution of judgment funds awarded the Miamis. But this is not what we asked for, and the business committee rejected same. If you would try for what we asked, okay. If not, forget it. Missionary, a Kimmelholt. When the university asked him, what do you think about our name, our nickname? He said, I would be very reluctant to make a recommendation or suggestion. After all, I'm not a militant. That letter is often forgotten in favor of the resolution that the university wrote and sent to Oklahoma and then the tribe signed. That said they actually were proud of the nickname. The university was very happy that it had succeeded in the 1970s. They wrote to their alumni, look at how great we're doing. Scholarships for Native students were made possible because of our taking a positive view of a particular situa situation as compared with, another dichotomy, cutting our relationships with the American Indian and letting that race drift. In 1966, when Chief Olds drove to an interview, the journalist asked, do you know how to drive a car? And that's reported in the Mima, Oklahoma newspaper. <laughs> And we think he drove a 1960s Ford Fairlane. Uh, I talked to Dust Chief, Second Chief Olds about this. Dustin, you said something beautiful, which is a true gem. I think you told me, and I'll try to quote it. It was one of those cars that's 30 feet long and drives like a dream. <laughs> so what is activism? What is a relationship? We use the term relationship a lot. Let me put it to you this way. Two conservative institutions, I think it's fair to say, a nation and an American college, one built on the other one's land, meeting in the context of a race-based nickname, develop a radically innovative relationship that apparently other institutions cannot replicate. I said that I thought, boy, I should have an answer for how, how it was actually done. I'll leave that to Kara. <laughs> but think about those embers, 1974, 1975, Chief Floyd Leonard visits. 1983, the Leonard's home base in Oxford. 91, the first students who prepare the ground. There's a spark now, it's getting a little bit warmer. I mean, students are here for the first time in 1991, 1809 to 1901, 1991. Sovereignty, 1996, now there's some heat. Be it resolved that the Miami tribe can no longer support the use of the nickname and suggest that the Board of Trustees of Miami University discontinue it and other Indian related names. Before the 1972 resolution said, may this nickname be blessed as long as the wind shall blow. And I'm struck by, I want to highlight that the nation in 1996 said, may this relationship be blessed as long as the wind shall blow. The beginning of the Red Hawks era. 
a lot of people at the university didn't understand that the, the relationship actually was launched. Gained, track, gained heat. More people surrounding that fire, more faces basking in the glow after the nickname was changed. I think I'll end largely with this, which is a meeting that was recounted last night and has been recounted in an interview before that. Julie Olds came to Oxford in November of 2000. There in the room was Reed Anderson, Bobby Burke, people in this room, Daryl Baldwin, Joe Leonard, who has been in every single Miamia function uh, since the 1980s, as far as I can tell, Murtis Powell, and I think Jim Hamill was there as well, people from the tribe and the university and both. Julie Old said, and I'm going to quote here, not from last night, but from a previous interview, I remember being so nervous and fumbling through and presenting what we wanted to do. We had come so far, and now for our hopes and dreams to ever really be possible, we believed that we needed to establish an understanding with a university. I remember being very afraid. She said, if we're not going to do this revitalization thing here, we'll do it somewhere else. Ertis Powell, whose personality jumps off the page, said, it's going to happen here. And Bobby Burke, who wrote everything down, has <laughs> notes from that day. And that's why I know it's November 30th. And she wrote, going to happen here. <laughs> it's corroborated, believe me. But it's still a grasping, a relationship sometimes is a grasping type of thing. There are many sticky points, salary, title, name of this thing Daryl is to direct. That's what Murders Powell said in internal documents. Daryl Baldwin revising kind of a mission statement. He was talking about the creation and staffing of a, we'll change the following when we decide on a name center institute of Miami Indian culture to be housed at Miami University. I wanna highlight Reed Anderson in his memory because it's so poignant and I think it's worth saying. Miami and he said Miami not Miami people. He said Miami were the recipient. The main purpose of all this was not to create a huge body of academic research, but to do research in an applied way that would benefit the Miami nation. It wasn't a hard sell. Maybe there's heat already, but it took a lot of explaining for people to think, well, how is this going to work? We've never seen anything like this. I think that's what we're talking about this weekend. <laughs> Continue to talk about it. Where have we been and how did we get here and where are we going? My colleague Kara Strauss will take over for me. Hi, Jake. To pay when you lock a cocky or a hanungi kaki kwe, mahkun to pawe in swaane. Hi, everyone. I'm I'm Kara Strauss. It's good to see you all today. And um, I think it's fitting that I'm taking over in 2001 um, because when I talk about this relationship, and I do quite frequently these days, um, I tell people that it's unique in the country, that we don't know of any other university that has a relationship like this one. And when I'm asked what makes it unique, it's that a university has created space for a tribal nation to do their own work for the benefit of their people. And that starts in 2001 with the creation of the Miamia Project, which we all know today as the Miamia Center. Um, and we see a, a little bit younger Daryl Baldwin in his very first office. <laughs> in 2001, and he is the first Miamia person to be a staff member here at Miami to do this work. The second, sorry, second staff person, the first um, executive director of the Miamia Center, I apologize um, for my mistake, but um, you know, this is, this is work that's driving, that's being driven by the tribe for the tribe, and that's the thing that changes in 2001. So we've had students here since 1991. You saw a picture of, of our first three students, um, but in the early years, there was not a whole lot here for them outside of financial aid. And that begins to change in 2003 when the Miami Heritage courses begin. And we start to get our students all together in the same place so that they can engage with their Miami Heritage 
um, learn their language, learn their history, um, and, and start to build a, a strong community here on campus. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about this um, relationship when we think of the timeline is, you know, the relationship starts in the 70s, the Miamia project begins in 2001. There was no formal documentation that outlined this relationship until 2006. It was really allowed to build, um, to grow, and to kind of figure out at least a little bit of, of what it was before we put legalistic terms to it. Um, and so in 2006, the Memorandum of Understanding was signed, which outlines the relationship um, and the responsibilities that each side of that relationship hold. And we still function under that Memorandum of Understanding today, and then add memorandums of agreement when we have new projects and procedures that we need to outline. In 2013, the Miamia Project transitions to the Miamia Center. And when we think about the way things work on a university campus, what this allowed was to make the center more permanent, to give it status on campus. And a lot of times we talk about that the center was really under the radar up until this point, and that this kind of made the Miamia Center come out from under the radar to be something that was, you know, on campus people knew more about it, wanted to engage with the work of the Miamia Center. In 2017, um, we released the Miamia Heritage logo, you know, talking about these embers that had built into a fire. And as this um, logo was being created, we went through a whole lot of iterations of what it could be. Um, pages and pages of iconography and, and graphics. And fire was the thing that especially Julie Olds kept coming back to, that we have built a fire here and that we need to remember that we have to tend this fire for it to move forward. And so that's how we came to the Miamia Heritage logo, which of course is inspired by Miamia ribbon work. And it's that red dot at the center that represents fire and is a visual reminder to both sides of this relationship that we have to tend this fire in order for it to move forward. And of course, today we see the Miamia Heritage logo all across campus on merchandise, on marketing, in athletics, which was a whole process in and of itself based on this history that we've heard about today. Um, but each one of these relationships continues to be strengthened through the work that we do together. So up until now, we've talked about the history, and we could only touch on a few of those pieces. There's so many other parts to this history that we could not um, cover. But we've hit a lot of very important milestones recently. In 2021, it was the 30th anniversary of the Miami Heritage Award. It was the 20th anniversary of the Miamia Center. And of course, this year is the 50th anniversary of this relationship. And so it feels like things have just continued to grow, continued to evolve, and they're really coming to a very unique culmination at this point. Of course, we know it's going to continue to move forward, but that's why we wanna take this time to really think back on our history so that we can truly celebrate everything that has happened in the last 50 years. So what has this looked like for the Miamia Center? Daryl arrived in 2001, one employee. Today we have 17 full and part-time staff members. We have nine faculty affiliates, a graduate fellow, a faculty fellow. We have six graduate assistants. This work has grown significantly in the past 20 years and it just continues to grow as we move forward. When we think about the projects that the Miamia Center has done, um, or really the projects that have happened as part of this relationship more broadly, in the early years, it involved field schools. Miami would take usually classes or groups of students to Miami, Oklahoma, so that they could learn from the tribe and oftentimes had a project that they would do at the end. And some of these were super, super important to um, the community, including bringing software that eventually turned into the newspaper that we all continue to read today. However, the difference is at that point, it was still Miami University primarily driving this work. It was Miami University students doing these projects. 
Whereas today, you've already heard presentations about Achim Wachiongonje, about the Ethnobotanical Database. We'll hear more about ILDA after this. And these are projects that are done truly in relationship, right? There's Miamia people, there's faculty, there's staff that all come together and that work is driven by the tribe to benefit the tribe. Here's a photo of our Miamia students from this year. Um, we have 38 Miamia students here at Miami University. This semester, our largest number ever, um, and we expect that to grow again next year. Um, things have, have continued to grow on the student front as well. We graduated our 100th um, alumni in May. We have exactly 100 Miami alumni of, Miami, of the Miami Heritage Program. We had our largest incoming cohort, as well as our largest um, total student body. Our students aren't just coming here in higher numbers, they have higher academic attainment. So prior to 2003, when the Miami Heritage course began, our students had a 56% graduation rate, higher than the national average for Native American students, actually by a lot. Um, but today, since the creation of the Miami Heritage classes, we have a 92% graduation rate for our students. They are being more academically successful because of the work that we're doing, because of the support that we're providing them to make sure that we're not just bringing them here with you know, financial aid, but that we're ensuring that they can be successful. When I first made this graph, I think two years ago, it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> it's a graph of our student enrollment over time since 1991 to, to now. Um, and it's, I mean, I can't say any more, right? Besides that our student numbers have just continued to grow. Um, it's possible we'll plateau at some point when we reach, you know, the highest number of, of Miami College age students who, who want to come here. Um, but I expect our number to be even bigger for next year as well. And I showed you the nice picture, but that's not the way I think of them. I think of them <laughs> more like they're presented in these photos. Um, these are taken at our retreat, which we have um, every year, the very first week of class, where we try to gather them together so that we can start off the year as a community and everyone can make sure that they, they know each other and feel like we're creating that Miami community here at Miami. This relationship, I've, I've explained to you that it's grown. I've been able to put data behind that growth. However, there are certain times in which you really feel the growth of the relationship and it's hard to put into words what that growth feels like but i think one of those times was this past october october when we had um, an event that commemorated the 175th anniversary of removal from our homelands and miami university drove the planning of an event that would remember that event remember its connection to miami university and i don't believe that event would have been possible a decade ago the relationship was not strong enough at that point. Miami didn't fully understand their history and their connection to Miami history well enough at that point. But we're there today, and we were able to have a lovely event, sad, but lovely, where everyone was able to join together in remembrance of, of this tragic event in Miami history. So this year in 2022, we are celebrating this history, this 50 years of history that we've just talked with you about today. We celebrate learning from each other. So how are we doing that? One of the ways is by being here today. <laughs> we had a kickoff event in Miami, Oklahoma, which um, unfortunately was not as large as, as we had hoped, um, but it was still a great event for our Miami community. We're having the largest Miami conference ever. Um, thank you all for being here today. We're also planning for a week-long celebration in November, November 7th through the 13th. So I hope many of you will join us for that. There will be a variety of events that happen that week. Um, we're going to have a big kickoff event that will involve the entire campus community. There will be football and hockey games, presentations, student life events, um, campus services does um, uh, dining hall events and those types of things. And so if you are able to come for one week, come for this week and you'll kind of get to see a little bit of everything. And um, we also have a couple of educational initiatives, a docu-series, a book that uh, you got a little bit of a preview today from, from Cam Shriver. 
Um, and so we'll be putting those out to the community as well. We also have a commemorative blanket. Um, there's an example of it in the back, which is actually on sale at the Miami University Bookstore, which is just across the street in Shriver, if any of you are interested. This blanket is a reminder of the coming together of these two relationships. The two turtles on there, one representing the community symbol and the tribe, the other the Miami heritage turtle, um, again, a reminder of, of this relationship. And the, the, one of the inspirations for this was Mah Kunzakwa's wearing blanket, um, which was on exhibit here. Um, in 2020, unfortunately, people didn't get to see it, but there is an online version of that exhibit, so I hope many of you get to explore. So I will end with this photo, which I often end with, because as I told you, this relationship is often hard to put into words. It's more a feeling. It's people getting together, right? And it's not the signing of documents, which we have many photos of people signing documents. Um, but to me, instead, it's getting down on the floor to play games together, right? This is what exemplifies this relationship. And so when Miami University and, and the Miami tribe are able to get together to learn from each other, that's when we're best able to feel the warmth of the fire that has been tended over the last 50 years. So Mission Neiwe to many folks across campus who have been integral to this relationship as well as to the planning of the 50th anniversary um, program that's going to happen through the rest of 2022. So Mission Neiwe. Okay, we're going to have our uh, linguistic team from the Miamia Center come up and share the incredible expansion work that we've done with at least our version of the ILDA uh, dic uh, dictionary and archive. So doctors uh, David Costa and Hunter Lockwood, it's all yours. Well, no. Oh, is this okay? That's good. Okay. Um, Jerome talked about ILDA a little bit earlier today, and uh, this is going to, I'm going to talk about ILDA, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, today I'm going to primarily talk about ILDA and how it specifically forms uh, the Miamia language uh, efforts that we do. So, but I'm actually glad that he introduced ILDA because it gives you a little more background than I would have time to do. And um, Before I get started, I would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Mellon Foundation for the funding that made the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive possible. Mishinewe. We are in the extremely fortunate position with Miamia language in that we are blessed with a truly exceptional amount of data spanning something like 230 years. In the early 1700s, three major French missionary dictionaries survive. From the 1800s through the early 1900s, there are four major language sources and another half dozen minor ones. Together, these manuscripts add up to thousands of pages of data and tens of thousands of words. For a long time, a major challenge uh, in learning, reconstructing, and teaching Miamia was how to pull all this data together in one place. Many of the best sources on Miami, Illinois are actually quite disorganized with most of the data in nothing like alphabetical order, making it hard to look anything up. There was a strong need for a single database where all the known Miamia data could be roped together in one place so that searches could be made, uh, easily be made spanning all the known sources of the language. There have been a few dictionary programs on the market for several years, but they are specifically designed for people doing field work and were a very poor fit for what we needed. As a result of this, the 20, in 2012, the Miamia Center decided to create its own database geared 
customized to our needs of teachers and learners. And the result is the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive, or ILDA for short. Originally, it was called MIDA, but it's now ILDA. ILDA has been in use for several years now, and it has transformed our ability to find data in the Miami language sources. As it is conceived of now, ILDA will eventually hold everything from all the sources, anything on the, on the Miami language or Peoria language. Over the past several years, we have managed to upload uh, all of several language sources and have begun to upload several others. So for the manuscripts here that have been completely entered into ILDA, we uh, began the project, thinking it would take three years and it actually took about one, uh, uploading all of Le Boulanger's 1725 French Illinois Dictionary, which came, presently comes to uh, 26,000 entries. Next, we uploaded all of Largillier's Illinois French Dictionary from 1690. Uh, which comes to over 31,000 additional entries. We did all of Trowbridge's Miami field notes from the um, Detroit Public Library from 1824 to 1825 with over 2,000 entries. And all of Michelson's 1960 Peoria field notes were with um, 1,388 entries. And we're still midway through several other uploads. We are about a third of the way through uploading Panette's Illinois Dictionary, and I'll show you shortly what these look like with about 7,955 entries so far. Almost all of Gatchett's original um, field notebooks on Miami and Peoria from the 1890s. And also remaining to be uploaded um, is the rest of Panette, the remaining two thirds, the rest of Gatchett's materials and everything Jacob Dunn got. None of Jacob Dunn's materials have been uploaded yet, but that's coming later this year. So how much data is now in the ILDA database, um, Miami data? All told, at this moment, ILDA has 78,428 entries total. There's a nice counter function in ILDA that tells you exactly how many forms there are in there. Uh, this time two years ago, when I was making notes for the talk I thought I was going to give in April of 2020, I saw that back then we had 59,000 entries at the time. So that tells you how much we were able to upload during COVID. And um, new data will, I suspect, probably will be still uploading new data for another eight or 10 years. And all of this data, I should emphasize this, is now searchable uh, all on a level field with each other for the very first time ever. Um, people, it's, I've always thought it's nice to sort of give people a perspective as to what these manuscripts I talk about actually look like. And there's not enough time to go into this, but this gives you a tiny little sampling of this. Um, this is one of the most famous sources from the Jesuit period. This is about a, a 500 plus page Illinois to French dictionary. It's what we refer to as Largillier from about the 1690s, but we're not sure. It's been entirely entered. As I said, it was the second thing we uploaded and it has 30, it counts for 31,000 of the entries we have at the moment. And this is a completely typical looking page chosen at random of what we had to key onto the computer and upload. And this is um, the Le Boulanger Dictionary. This currently lives at John Carter Brown Library in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, it counts for 26,000 of the entries and this dates through something somewhere around 1720, 1725. Um, this is Charles Trowbridge's field notes on Indiana, Miami, which are interesting because um, they were collected in Northern Indiana someplace in, 18, in the winter of 1824 to 1825. And previously, this was a very hard document to use because it existed in a terrible quality microfilm from the early 70s that I found so illegible I didn't even bother with it. And um, Jonathan and I went and filmed it in Detroit just ourselves. I mean, they gave us their blessing to do so when we simply went there and banged through it one page at a time. And so now uh, high quality images of it exist for the first time. And it's amazing that I never had access to it. When we finally had a legible copy, I was thrilled because. There's things in this that I was unaware of because the previous copy was so hard to use and now it's all keyed in and all searchable. It's uh, about 2,000 entries. And this is a typical example of what Albert Gatchett's field notes from the 1890s from Oklahoma look like. Uh, this, uh, we, so far, he got a lot more data than this, but so far we have about 9,000 entries and we're almost done entering this whole manuscript. And this is a, a story here. Um, I think this is one of the Wisaka Chakwa stories. This is right here, but this is a typical example of what his scribbly notes look like. 
almost all his work was in Oklahoma. And this is an example of the manuscript that we're about a third of the way th wading through right now. This is the Panet Dictionary, which some of you know was only f discovered in 1999. Um, the one I, when I went and looked at in Montreal a couple years back, and it's about one third entered. Um, it come, uh, the, about 8,000 entries entered, and this is what one of the nicer pages looks like. This is what one of the more manageable pages look like. This one's um, very small and hard to read, but just to give you some perspective, this is what one of the worst pages looks like. Um, some of the pages are, this is a, a manuscript that's so difficult that first we were not really entirely sure we were going to even do it, and we didn't want to punish our transcriptionists. And transcriptionist and, and translator with this, but with, well, we finished the other two in much less time than we thought, and it's like, well, you're still here. So there's other pages that look even worse than this, but this is what I found in a quick search as a fairly typical bad page. So this is why this, this we left this one for last, and it's probably, gonna, I suspect it's going to take another three to four years to finish keying in. Um, anyway, I also wanted to talk about the actual process. Um, Oh, okay. I want to talk about the process from which how does data from these actual paper or parchment manuscripts make the migration to being in a database. And basically, I mean, I could go into a lot more detail than this, but the original uh, images of the manuscripts are page and line numbered by Carol Katz, um, which means basically she keys in the manuscript and either Carol or someone she assigns the task to numbers the lines and the pages. Um, the content of the pages is keyed in, and like I said, that's done by Carol alone. Uh, if the translations of the Miamia words are in French, then the English translations of French of the French are added by Michael McCafferty, because not a lot of us read French, and especially not this weird 300-year-old French. So that makes the missionary stuff much easier to use. And then each entry is keyed to a high-quality JPEG image of its page. Right. So in other words, whenever you look up any word, there's a function where you can click on this button and it shows you with the, a very high quality JPEG of the image so you can see it in context um, in case it's not certain how to read it because this is not all clearly handwritten at all. You can say, well, does it really say that? And it actually, and it almost always really does say what Carol enters it as saying. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes I'm thinking, I, I look at it and I, I can't interpret this. I really hope Carol got it wrong. And I look at it, it's like, no, unfortunately, that's exactly what the manuscript says. And I can't say, oh, okay, it's really this. Um, and this is a typical spreadsheet of what the, the, what the spreadsheets look like when Carol and Michael are done with it. And you see, see the rightmost column, um, everything except the rightmost column is what Carol enters, and the rightmost column is Michael's translations. Um, Michael's very, very good at a kind of weird, archaic American French from the, the, the 1690s. And so um, that's what that's where this manuscript now stands. Is he's about a third of the way slot through slogging through the translations, but the, the legibility of the manuscript is what makes is what's making it go slower. And so this is the result when the data from those two people is uploaded to ILDA, and I haven't touched it yet. Um, this is basically an ILDA uh, entry uploaded before any of my analysis. And so you see all the different fields here, and the only fields that are filled are the original target language, which means the word that's in the manuscript exactly is spelled. Um, the original gloss, right, in other words, how does the original person who wrote this down translate it? Sometimes that's in French, sometimes it's in English. And Michael, and if it's in French, Michael's translation of the French in English. And that's all that's going to, that those are the only fields they fill. This is purely just verbatim as it is from the source. But it's then my job to actually analyze it. And my job is by, of analyzing these data is by far the slowest part of the process. We're uploading data much faster than it can be analyzed. And so, uh, and I looked around for a good example of, of an entry that's especially thoroughly filled out. And this is an example sentence from the, I believe, the Le Bourget Dictionary that pretty much has a little of everything. It has, it's a full sentence. It has the translation of the sentence. It has what the sentence really means. It has an analysis and breakdown of every single word in the sentence. You know, like you'll look down there on the lower left and the upper right, and every word is broken down and given the individual translations, and there's a few cognates given, like which is the same words in either other Miami sources or 
other Algonquian languages. And there's even some semantic fields in the lower right-hand corner. Like, those are the fields where it's like, you know, we've had the thought, we thought to ourselves, what things might people want to look up? Like, you know, okay, they might want to look up tree names or they might want to look up food terms. And so eventually that should become very useful for searches. I think mean, eventually the idea would be, give me a list of all tree names and all those manuscripts and that's what we would bring up. So, so this is what it looks like after I've done full analysis for it. And I should also talk about the use that ILDA gets in the community uh, in the sense that our language teachers and learners uh, make a very extensive use of ILDA now, even though it's not, this, not, this is a different program from the online dictionary, but it's kind of what I call a linguist's and a teacher's learning tool. And a very common use for it is queries on how to say things from various tribe members, teachers, and learners. And so, for example, we had a recent request, which you saw earlier today, on how to say welcome. And so we sort of dug around in ILDA for examples, different English words that seem to match that concept. And eventually we were able to find this, which is uh, the set of results for the verb stem, which means something like honor, admire, or welcome, or something like that. And you'll notice that um, certain words appear multiple times in the manuscripts, which is actually kind of good because it means that you get several examples of different takes on what it means or how to spell it or that sort of thing. So this is a very recent example of when we used ILDA to sort of fill a gap in, you know, a word that, an expression we needed to provide. How am I doing on time now? Oh, fine, okay. And um, since I mentioned the online dictionary, I was told not to really go into too much detail on it, but I'll allude to it here because it does relate. The online dictionary is a separate database. I should make that clear. It's a completely separate program, um, which is what we call the student. It's really best viewed as a student's dictionary. Um, MIDA, I'm sorry, ILDA is a sort of a researcher's dictionary where all the data is just there in raw form. And, and for a while, it's not processed yet. The online dictionary is a separate database where, that Jared maintains where we basically tidy up the data and in a much more sort of easy to consume form where you can look words up and you can like for example this is the entry that was just recently created for welcome or honor or admire and you know we have some example sentences we have some what we figure will probably be common use inflected verbs and also links to the sound files now the way this relates to ilda is that I, could, I, I won't go into much detail on this, but ILDA and MIDA both draw from the same pool of data. If a form is entered in one of the two databases, it's accessible and visible to the other. So, so the two databases sort of feed each other. As I've always said, there was a when we started this project out, we, I, I was fairly emphatic that we should not try to combine a researcher's dictionary and a student dictionary at the same time, because every time I've seen that attempted, it kind of does a poor job of both. And so we said, let's just keep them separate. Let's just have one for the sort of researchers and nerd use and for the archival use, and another for people who are trying to, you know, just ordinary humans who are trying to learn the language, you know, and who don't have, have never taken linguistics classes. And so that's the reason for the two. And I, I think it was a very smart decision to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I knew I, I knew we were saving people a lot of suffering. <laughs> um, and quick um, detour into the linguistic benefits of ILDA. Um, as I said, a huge amount of language data is now searchable for the, and findable for the very first time, especially in the Illinois dictionaries. Uh, this has made it possible to research many topics much more thoroughly than ever before. And uh, I actually use it in my linguistics papers extremely extensively now. It's actually made my linguistics papers look different in terms of what I can, the data I can pull together for them. Um, for example, I did a paper, I have a paper in process now about this word kati, which you people use all the time, which means will or the future, future marker and so forth. And this is a very hard word to research just by looking at the manuscripts because it doesn't appear, you can't look it up in alphabetical order, right? Because it's just one word and what you want if you're going to study this, is sentences. And so you're hardly going to find, um, before this was searchable, the examples you're going to find were just going to be by accident. But now you can literally just go into ILDA, set, make the search settings correctly, and say, search for all set examples of the whole word examples of the future particle, right? And so suddenly, instead of having about 
20 examples of this, I now have a couple hundred. And so as an example, um, there's different ways the particle is spelled. And if you add together all these different spellings, there's, yeah, 426 examples in ILDA now, and there will be more to come with this future particle. And so uh, this is a fairly typical example of a few pages of the search results that come up when you search on the, on the future particle. And so I was basically able to just browse, browse through this and see if any of the examples contradicted my claims, see what examples look especially easy to understand, and so forth. So one of its biggest benefits was you can find example sentences, which means they're not just little isolated sentences, but it's like grammar and like the language actually working instead of being, you know, this isolated little object. Um, and finally, there is still a lot left to do. Um, several data sources, including one or two big ones, still remain to be uploaded, haven't been uploaded at all. But the main work left is the remaining, my remaining analysis to be done. Uh, as I said, the uploading of new data proceeds much more quickly than my ability to analyze it. Um, the great majority of the data in ILDA, while searchable, still isn't analyzed. So while it's translated, the translations are often not quite as accurate as one might, might wish. So the data will be even more usable when it's analyzed. Uh, and I would have to emphasize the process of analyzing all the data in ILDA will easily take decades to come for myself and other linguists working for the center. Um, I think it is possible that all of the manuscripts might be uploaded into ILDA in about eight years max. That's po I think. I, I think if we are able to focus on it, that might actually be a finishing point. However, that's just the raw data basically being in a program. In terms of analyzing it, I um, I don't think that's a project that will be completed in my lifetime. So just to let you know, this is basically a project that will go on for as long as people find it valuable. So because there's going to be, we'll, we could probably top out of at maybe 100,000 or 120,000 words in the database when we're done, is my guess. And so how much did I get to it? Time? Is this about right? And so now I'll hand things off to you. Um, so speaking of other linguists who work at the center, um, that's me. Um, my name is Dr. Hunter Thompson Lockwood, and um, I have had the chance to meet many of you before at various points along the way, either at Winter Gathering or um, at the National Breath of Life conferences or various other places along the way. Um, but for those of you who do not know me, um, as I mentioned uh, my name already, I studied under Dr. Monica McCauley at uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison, and we spent about uh, who has spent her she has spent about 20 years plus uh, working with the Menominee uh, Nation of uh, Wisconsin. And um, I am a non-native linguist <laughs> who works for Meow Meow people. I like to, to frame things that way. Um, I grew up in a place that most people just call up north um, in the land I was ceded by Anishinaabe people in the Washington, uh, Treaty of Washington in 1836. Um, and I consider myself an Algonquianist really generally. I'm interested in uh, history, language, culture. All these things are impossible to separate for me um, and for many other people, I think, too. Um, although for those of you in this room, that's not super surprising news. There are many linguistic spaces where that is a controversial opinion. Um, and I've never heard an Anishinaabem name for the place that I grew up, um, but we call it Houghton Lake in English. Um, I began working um, my career in 2008, working with uh, Ojibwe speakers, uh, speakers of Ojibwe in Ottawa. And I just have to take a moment to um, give some honor to these people who, um, after a few months of interacting with me, trusted me with their language enough that I was drafted by the man on the right, Howard Kimwan, um, to help teach his language. And I did not do a great job teaching it, but I did my best to give back where I was asked. Um, and the man in the middle, uh, Alphonse Peter Wanquat, both of them at the time worked for the University of Michigan, Alphonse still does. Um, and they're both Ottawa Ojibwe speakers from Manitoulin Island. Of course, naming a language as Ottawa or Ojibwe has its own set of controversies I will skip over for now. And um, since there are major reasons that I am here in the first place, um, I just wanted to take a moment for them. Um, and not pictured here is a, a Potawatomi elder who I owe an immense debt of gratitude to, who I will not name or show, um, because that is my understanding of the cultural teachings since he has recently left us. But I need to take a moment to honor him. Um, I used to badger all of these men with persistent questions about why does this word look this way? Why do you say it this way and not this way? Why do you put these things together? And um, oftentimes I would receive a response, something like, 
It just depends on how a native speaker would have perceived it. It depends on how a fluent speaker would have looked at a thing or an event or a process and how it would have entered their minds. And that's why we put these things together the way we do. And of course, I had no idea what that meant <laughs> for many years, and I'm still trying to figure it out in some ways. But um, that's one of the things I sort of like to think about, right? So um, my sort of research, uh, broadly speaking, um, is, is really varied, but ultimately it comes down to a lot of things about words. I like to think about what a word is. Um, so it feels like a simple question, but it actually is an endless rabbit hole. Uh, are, are the words made of little pieces, or are those little pieces the words themselves and the bigger words maybe just even illusions or more like phrases? Um, where do things go in a word like stress? How do I decide um, where to put the main stress in a word? Um, how are all the different and interrelated Algonquian languages similar? How are they different? Um, and all sorts of questions about variation. What, what kind of variation do we see across space and time and place and even within speaker communities, a sort of variation that sometimes gets ignored in language reclamation projects. Um, it all can sound sort of simple, but as any good student of Miyamiyata Wangi knows, even simple words can be full of complexity and surprises. Um, so that's sort of a brief overview of what I do. But for me, it's not just enough to kind of idly think about words. Um, I'm more interested in this notion of reciprocity that uh, Dr. Leonard really talks about very aptly. Um, how can we as linguists um, contribute to your knowledge and your sorts of actions and activities and causes and um, politics and advance, uh, advance things for you? For me, it's, it's more about taking the knowledge that I have gained and then pumping it right back into Miami people and causes and programs and classes and however else it might be useful. I'm not really interested in linguistic theory only to the extent that it can help people. Um, I had an anecdote where once I told one of my professors of phonology, that's a certain way of studying sound, that I wanted to use linguistics to help people. And she looked at me and said, how do you do that? And I said, I'll, I'll let you know one day. Um, and that's just another thing about speakers sometimes being the furthest thing from linguists' minds, unfortunately. Um, so when thinking about how to put our sort of knowledge to good use, one of the things I think about a lot, um, and I'm thinking about this a lot too with Dr. Monica, Monica McCauley at University of Wisconsin, um, still is, is lexical expansion is what we call this now. You might hear other names like neologism and coinage, but it's all about how do we get more words? How do speakers of all human languages get more words over time and over change? Because humans are not static creatures, right? We don't just sit in a point in space. Um, we are constantly moving and changing and experiencing new things. Every new thing that we experience has an effect on us. Um, and this is just sort of one way that language and culture revitalization and reclamation projects can kind of go hand in hand. Um, very frequently, new words have to be uh, invented or created or found, as in the case uh, of what we saw with the welcome example, and that is one of the things that our office deals with a lot, is requests for vocabulary. Uh, when something must be innovated, we innovate it, but of course we like to see what is there in the big data first, um, and that's something that we're tuned to in a moment. Um, and what I'd like to point out here is that the kind of work we do doesn't just involve, you know, haphazardly creating words willy-nilly. It involves taking a look at those hundreds of years of documentation and, and thinking about the speakers and why they made the decisions they did. Why did they put these pieces together in this way? Um, and it's sort of a conversation across time, as at least that's how I think about it. Um, when linguists consider uh, lexical expansion, we're really good at these first two considerations. Most linguists will think about grammatical considerations. So how is it that we get new forms in a language, right? How do we get new pieces to put together? How do new words come about at, at all? And semantic considerations. So how do we get new meanings, right? Do old meanings change and flex or, 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 or contract um, and become more specific? And we're not as good <laughs> at some other sets of things. I've just included one of those things that linguists are not very good at here. And that's a set of like aesthetic considerations and a wide number of other Cultural is the sort of euphemism we use for an incredible complex tapestry. Um, so we as linguists are not very good at saying what makes a beautiful Miyamiya word, right? What makes a Miyamiya word that you go, oh, that's a really, really neat word. Um, that's sort of, that's where the language belongs to you all, right? I can answer questions like, well, here's what a word like that could look like. 
here's five different options that all make sense from some set of linguistic considerations. <laughs> but ultimately, those decisions aren't really mine to make. Um, and just to sort of revisit this point that you've now heard um, over and over again, the power of the ILDA platform is that it collects all of these centuries of words and, and speakers together in one place. That is not something that most projects that I've worked on can do. And I've worked on quite a few language revitalization projects, lexical documentation projects now. And for the most part, they take a very small slice of time um, and occasionally you get a few other slices of time. One of my good friends and colleagues, Robert Lewis, works with the Potawatomi community, and he has um, a, about a 100-year slice of data. And even for, for that's like really exciting. Um, and we don't we have 5,000 words in the database that I helped work on for the Potawatomi. This is 78,000 entries, right? It's an incredible amount of data. And that direct connection, right, between Jared's office, the dictionary office, the community applications of this stuff, and the research office, that's absolutely unique, right? A lot of the projects I've worked with, unfortunately, have um, kind of community applications as a hopeful eventual outcome, right? Well, we're going to do this stuff, and then hopefully one day it'll make back to the community, hopefully, right? But this is its direct connection all the time, and it's a fundamental part of our method. Um, so I'm going to transition a little bit then into morphology into a little bit of grammar. Um, thinking first about simple words, and I put simple intentionally in scare quotes because that is a very loaded word. But we as grammarians refer to a word sometimes as simple if it does not appear to have any internal structure, right? So if I take a word, a look at a word like cow, no one in, the, in this room would probably say, well, the word cow comes from a meaningful piece, ka, and then there's the ow, and that, no, that doesn't really make sense to us as speakers of English. But a word like cow hand, has these two full words in it, each one means something. And I wanna note that the hand part of cow hand is meant to be a person, right? We're not talking about a hand that a cow has and carries around in its mouth. We're, we're using hand as a stand-in for the relationship between a hand and a person. So it's a kind of a part for whole relationship, which we call metonymy, but it's not a word that you have to know. Um, and metonymy, as many people have pointed out to us uh, over the last 25 years, there's a wonderful paper by um, uh, Leanne Hinton uh, in the 1990s, that metonymy is a really, really, really common way that Native people over the last, since time immemorial, have created words. And that's one of the things um, that I like to take a look at is how, how did speakers encode their relationships to objects um, forever. And thinking about now somewhat more complex terms, these are three different words for key, and we see two different Ojibwe words for key. And the first thing I want to say is then it's not there's the Ojibwe way of saying key, right? There were and are many ways of saying these things depending on how a speaker would have perceived it, right? How it entered a speaker's mind. And so what is a key? If we think about a key, not in terms of a keyboard, but in terms of a thing that we use in everyday lives, right? Um, well, it's often metal, but it doesn't have to be. It's often small, but it doesn't have to be. But if it doesn't lock and unlock things, it's not a key, right? And so most of the time when I see a word for key across the Algonquian languages, it encodes an associated action for the key, right? A key is a thing for either locking or unlocking. And we see two different Ojibwe words for key that mean both. And the Miamia word I've found for key uh, indicates that it's a tool for locking. So that's sort of neat. We see these similarities and differences across speakers, across time, across languages, across space. Um, speakers for thousands and thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial have had to create entirely new terms. And they often make use of these sorts of relationships between actions and objects and the way that they're used from a human perspective. Um, in this case, that association is not a body part, like a hand being a person, or sometimes you see a head standing for a person, but it's the thing that it is used for. And I, I note that I've included some things in quotes afterwards in parentheses, and what did those mean? Where do they come from, right? I call them literal translations, but where do I get these literal translations from? And the short answer is that we get them from comparing lots and lots and lots and lots of words, thousands and thousands of words across all sorts of spaces. And when you start to look at the little pieces of the words, then you start to notice patterns within that of why, why certain meanings are the way they are. And then you start to see some other structures in the language that are very important that speakers knew and know how to manipulate when they really can speak the language fluently. Ojibwe and Miami, Illinois both share this one form 
So in the previous instance, we saw a new word coming about, new, new grammatical pieces coming together to create a meaning. In this case, we see two forms that are essentially the same. In Miyamiya, we have this word, tepanamani, which means I can reach it, I can handle it, I can put my arms around it, right? We've got this little verb piece, which I have glossed as act on it by hand. But of course, if you went out and asked the speaker, hey, what does in mean? They couldn't tell you because it's not something that can just be used. But at the same time, they have full control over these pieces and how they're put together. In Ojibwe, however, that same form with the same pieces in the same grammatical context not only means I can reach for it and touch it and manipulate it with my hands, but it also means by metaphorical extension, I achieve it, right? I reach a goal, I accomplish it. And in other varieties of Ojibwe, it means something like I receive it, right? So I'd like actually take ownership of something. Um, this is a way that the meanings change without the forms changing, right? So we see, we see that sometimes too. Um, in this case, a sort of a metaphorical extension. Um, and that's by hand as opposed to other ways that we could imagine reaching something. For instance, there's a little verb final that means by foot or force of body, or there's another verb final that means something like using a tool to do something. So there's a lot of different kinds of combinations that we can make. And when we compare enough words across enough languages, we see the same kinds of relationships with the same kinds of pieces showing up over and over again, but also huge differences, really important differences like we've seen over the last few examples. So one reason I bring this up is so that if I accidentally go into Ojibwe brain, you'll understand <laughs> that that's just where I've been for a while and I'm doing my best. Um, but by seeing these persistent kind of recurring relationships uh, with differences and a, sort of a life of their own in all the different languages, um, that, is, that is sort of where my brain lives a lot. That's sort of where my research sits. Uh, in the Potawatomi community I just was working with, um, we sometimes, and the, the speakers and the, and the teachers, sometimes refer to these pieces as verb guts. And this is a metaphor that made many of my Euro-American colleagues cringe because of the thought of the viscera being, you know, described. But I think it's actually kind of an interesting metaphor, right? The, the guts are all crucially interrelated in these very principled ways. They crucially belong to the organism. And if you just take a piece of the gut out, it's not very useful to the organism it belonged to. And yet they can be described precisely um, and they're incredibly important as well. Um, although it does make some people wince a little bit to think about. Um, so that's all I'll go for today, but I am always happy to answer questions at, about any of these things and more. My goal for today and over the last um, while, I suppose, since I've been working here, has just been to immerse myself in as much of the material as possible. And as Dave and others have pointed out, there is an immense amount of material over a lot of time and a lot of space. And so hopefully after seeing a little bit more of my work as my our time and our interactions go on, you'll want to say, may I tape it. And I hope I've given you something to think about with that last tape. So mission there. A nice example of but with the actual uh, analysis and interpretation of language. There's a lot to know and there's a lot to think about before it actually gets to our learning programs. And that's, that's a good experience of that. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes. So if you want to take a quick break and be back here ready to go by three, um, that'll give our um, panel a little bit of time to set up.
Well, that was a fast quiet down. If only my students would listen to me that easily. <laughs> so I, Achaiki. Um, I found that incredibly interesting. Sometimes I find it hard to connect to, to the linguists a little bit. But Hunter said humans are constantly changing, growing, moving, and that's where I come in, right? So that's where my work happens. So I am here to speak, you know, moderate this panel of students and alumni about the Student Experience as Heritage Award uh, program students. So I cheki kisha koko wins wa ane ne hini la miami kuya te pewe ne olaka koke cheki oaha. Hi everyone, my name is Haley Shea, and I'm a member of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. I said it's good to see you all here today. Um, so I am currently, as you know, you can see on the slide, I'm currently a research associate at the Miami Center in the Office of Assessment and Evaluation. I am also a visiting assistant professor in educational psychology. So I teach. I, my training is in counseling psychology, so I teach counseling classes to master's students in school psychology. Um, I grew up when I was about 10 is when I started attending tribal programming, right? So I, I went to the very first A1 Zapata camp, went all the way through that, attended Miami University as a Heritage Award student myself, and then I pursued a PhD in counseling psychology at Iowa State University. After doing my doctoral internship, came back here, to work for the Miami Center, right? And I, I say that, I give you that background because I feel that I'm a little bit uniquely positioned to be doing the work that I do. So as I said, I work for the Office of Assessment and Evaluation, which is a broader umbrella for many of you are familiar with the work of the NIP Wyona Acquisition and Assessment Team, or we call NOT. Um, NOT is now one of three teams that exists within the Office of Assessment and Evaluation. Right. So as tribal programming grew, we experienced a need for further assessment and evaluation. We had greater demands for this from for tribal programming. And that's why the office was created. Right. One of the privileges that I have in my role is that I get to speak with every student since 2019, at least with every student at the beginning of their career as Heritage Award Program students at Miami University. I interview them, I get to hear their stories, their experiences, and then I interview them again after they end the program. So four years later, off, most often, sometimes longer, um, but most often four years later when they're graduating, and I talk with them about what their experience was like and what's changed over the course of those four years. Right? And so that's what I'm here to do today, is to, to moderate a panel so that those students can tell you this story on their own. Right? I can't share their individual stories, that's part of research ethics, but they can share their stories with you. And so I can ask them some questions that are comp similar to what we might ask in an interview and you can get a good idea of what that's like. Um, I think particularly interesting this year is that we have two alumni on our panel, right? So we have current students, three current students and two alumni to give you an experience or give you an understanding of how the program has maybe changed over time, right? What has changed since I'm going to call you out, Mika, but Mika's the oldest on the panel. <laughs> um, so what's changed since she was here to when Brad was here and now the current students? So without further ado, I will start with the first question. I simply asked each of them to introduce themselves, right? Specifically, whatever you feel is appropriate. I'm open to you all sharing, but specifically name, major or former major for alumni, year of a graduation, either expected or actual, and then for the alum, what their current position is. Away. Yep. Aya, uh, it's really good to be here today. Can, you stand up? I don't know. Can everybody see me? Okay. Um, my name is Mika Leonard. Um, as Haley pointed out, I guess I'm the elder of this panel. Um, I actually graduated in 2006, so don't do any quick math. Um, <laughs> and I studied linguistics as well as French, um, East Asian studies, which at the time was a minor. I believe now it's a major. And, oh my God, oh, something else that I'm, I had another minor, I forget what it is now. It's been a while. Um, I currently live in Denver, Colorado with my husband and my 19 month old who is currently napping, but should be joining us later. Um, again, I graduated in 2006 and I work at a national trade association based out of Washington DC um, called the Native American Financial Services Association, which is a huge mouthful, and I'm, I'm in the chief operations officer role there. I've been doing that for four years. I've worked uh, a lot in Indian country, and I'm just really excited to be on this panel and share a little bit more 
about what I'm doing and about this um, the Heritage Award and kind of be amongst my panelists. So again, nice to be here today. Hi, Acheke. Uh, Wapangia Wainzwane. It's the first time I've been able to say that. It's exciting. Uh, uh, my name is Brad Kasberg. I'm from Parma, Ohio. Uh, I graduated in 2012 uh, with um, master's, or sorry, with uh, a dual degree in geography and anthropology and under uh, a minor in urban and regional analysis, I think is what they call it. Um, I went to uh, the University of Michigan to get my master's in landscape architecture. Uh, I live in Chicago now, Chicago, um, and I am uh, I work at Argonne National Lab, which is like a Department of Energy uh, research institution, and I'm a, a sustainable landscape specialist. So I do environmental research um, uh, on on various energy projects, um, and I also do um, essentially like private contractor work for like environmental work for um, 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 stuff relating to uh, uh, indigenous conservation issues. Hi, I'm Kayla Wayne's Viani. Um, I am a 32 year, old, 32 year old mother of five and I'm actually considered a freshman here at Miami. Um, I am studying computer science. Um, tell you about it. <laughs> I am Pendrel Rainswane. Uh, I'm Logan Patrick. I am a physics major and a math minor. I'm expected to graduate next year in 2023, and I'm from Plainview, Texas. Hiya, Akuka Wainswa'ane. My name's Stella. I am from Southern Michigan. I am a double major in journalism and emerging technology and business design. Um, I'm a senior, so I'll be graduating next month. And is there anything else? No? All right, that's it. Yay, congrats, Stella. <laughs> so the next question. You know, as you can tell, just based on these introductions, our students come from a whole lot of different places in their lives, right? And so I was hoping that each of you could share, or not each of you, but you know who you are, <laughs> could share a little bit about what factors contributed to your de decision to attend Miami University. So like I said, I, um, I'm a 32-year-old mother of five. Um, I didn't see myself going back to college. Um, we moved to Connersville, Indiana, which is about a 45-minute drive from here. Um, so it wasn't too bad. And my kids are starting to get to the age where they're going to start going back to school. And I realized um, that retail, which is what I had always worked, is kind of a dying thing. So I needed to find a new career when they start school. So I kind of had considered, and I had actually talked to Bobby Burke a couple times about coming back and never did it. Um, and then the school had provided the opportunity for us to do um, a mini MBA program. And I was like, sure, why not? You know, I'm just going to sit here and do it at home. No big deal. Um, and I guess it was supposed to take like a couple months to do, and I ended up finishing it in less than a week. And when I told Kara, I didn't realize that that was like a big deal. And I told Kara and she was like, oh, you're done. Oh, OK. And I was like, maybe maybe this is something I could do. And so I decided at that moment that I was going to go back to school. Um, kind of the previous times when I had talked to Bobby Burke about it, I had been like, oh, well, if I go back. And so I never did. So I decided at that moment that it had to be, a OK, what do I do now? Because if I say, well, if I do this, what do I do now? It's not going to happen. So I just decided like, okay, now what? Now what? And I just kind of decided then that I didn't have an option. And that's kind of how I ended up here. Uh, personally, for me, the reason I came to my university is I grew up a lot with a lot of tribal influence. So growing up, my brother came here before me. And then I knew a lot of the staff. And I knew there was just a good place that I could come and kind of learn more about my culture and learn more about my Miami identity. And it was a really good opportunity for me to just come to school out here, get a different place because I'm from Oklahoma, oh, uh, Texas. So see more Midwest and just kind of learn more about my identity and such. 
And so that was the biggest influence. And then also meeting uh, President Crawford at one of the winter gatherings just before the pandemic, before I came to school here, I talked, I got a chance to talk to him a little bit about the physics program and hear about how good it was and such like that, him being a physicist himself. And so I thought it would also be just a good school to come to for that. And so that's, here I am. I think I forgot to mention that I'm actually from Oxford. Um, I was born down the road, like quite literally. Um, so I've spent, I spent my whole life here until it was time to go to college. And I think there was just never a question of where it was always, like, you're just going to go to Miami. And I applied early decision uh, pretty early on, I think in my senior year. And I actually started taking classes here because for Talawanda students, which is the local high school, you can take um, classes here through, I think the Department of Education for the state of Ohio or something like that. So I actually took like a whole year's worth. It was a really good way to get out of going to actual school as a senior. So uh, I did a lot of my prereqs before freshman year even started and, you know, just kind of launched right in. So yeah, for me, it was just, um, I guess, a little embedded. And my brother had also gone here. My dad taught here. So we're pretty much a Miami University family as well as Miamia. Guess we now know how you had two majors and two minors. <laughs> All right. So our next question, right? So some, most, a lot of our students have different experience levels with engaging with the tribal community when they come into Miami University, right? And that there's a full range of experiences that folks had. So I was hoping to give um, some examples of that. So in what ways did you interact with the tribe and or your Miami identity prior to attending Miami University? And then I also have a follow-up here. I'll ask now, but you all can answer whenever. How has that shifted since? Uh, so I um, I knew I was Miami. I, uh, I definitely didn't know I was Miami. Uh, that word was not in my vocabulary. Um, and I knew my great grandmother's name, and I knew that the Wabash was important. Those are the things I knew, um, and that's it. Uh, I, the way I interacted with it, engaged with it, it was um, something that was always interesting, and it was always something that was like mentioned. Uh, just like, yeah, where am I? And it was like, you know, like a cool thing to say at school. Uh, and uh, I like, I, I have vivid memories of uh, my sisters are older than me, like nine and five years older, and just like pulling out an encyclopedia and like reading the Miami tribe, you know, third of a page, one column thing, um, and like looking at the picture of Chief Little, Little Turtle um, and like that encompassed my identity. So um, it was always something that I thought was compelling and interesting. And I always tried to do small little research stuff for like school with it. But, you know, rudimentary, you know, uh, home encyclopedia book was really the, the extent of it. Uh, my experience with the try before is I was very lucky uh, to have active participation for most of my life. Uh, for my, my mom, my grandma, and my great-grandma, so a couple of generations back, have been pretty active in the tribe. So we, I remember just kind of being dragged along, younger child, not really understanding it, coming to annual meetings, uh, getting to watch my brother go to A1 Zapata, and then the, our language camp, and wanting to be old enough so I can finally go before we had the younger program which unfortunately the year that I was old enough to go, uh, the overnight camps was canceled. And I was really sad about that. It was a uh, heartbreaking for me, partly. I always, I still blame Chinguia for that. I, he, <laughs> not the person to blame, but he is a good person to blame, I should say. And so then uh, after that, once we figured out our travel plans and we're old enough to like drive and such like that, I started attending more of camps and come down here. So I went through the program as a camper and then eventually went through the process of junior counselor, then counselor. So I got a full year around of that, as well as just always have been able to attend summer camps and 
the annual meeting and winter gatherings when we could. Yeah, so I also attended A1 Zapata um, during the summertime, but outside of that, I didn't interact with the tribe very much. Um, I obviously knew I was Miamia, but it wasn't something that I thought about the rest of the year outside of those like week or so in the summer. Um, and that's really shifted drastically since I started the Heritage Award program. Um, I mean, I interact with this community every single day now. Um, we're required to go to some stuff. So it started as a freshman going to the things that we had to go to. And then I just started making friends and enjoying practicing the culture more. So it turned into like, you know, going on the trips to Oklahoma for annual meeting and stuff. And I just really started forming a community around me. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that, that sense of community is something that really stands out in the interviews that I do with students. That's the thing that tends to, you know, really crystallize while students are at Miami, in, in the Heritage Ward program specifically at Miami, and is what carries them forward after. So my next question is, what did you expect to learn in the Heritage Award program, right? So putting on your hat of like, before you came, what did you think you were going to learn? I guess I didn't really know too much of what I thought I was going to learn other than that we are we studied three topics and that they rotated. Um, and I'm really sorry, George, but I was really disappointed when it wasn't language this year. <laughs> um, but I actually ended up being uh, really surprised. I think the reason I was disappointed is because I didn't know what ecological perspectives was. Um, but once I found out, I actually no offense, Chinguia, but I might enjoy it more than the language. So we'll have to see how you do next year. Uh, so some additional background. Um, I didn't start at the Heritage Program when I was a freshman. I didn't know this existed at all. Um, I just was here and then um, sort of announced to myself at the at Bonham House. Uh, um, <laughs> But uh, so I, st I started my s second semester of my junior year is when I started the heritage program. Um, so I, I, there's a common narrative I hear about people, especially who don't have a long um, connection to the tribe when they come here as a freshman as being an outsider. So I felt that and then like doubly so because like I was like a pretender to the throne, you know, sort of thing. Um, and so I, I yeah, I, what, what did I expect? I expected just to kind of just like be loosely aware of some stuff and just be thankful to be, you know, invited. Um, yeah, I, I, I studied anthropology, so, you know, I had the broader concepts of, you know, traditional ecological knowledge um, and like the, the relationship between language um, and, and culture and all that. So like I had the, um, the points of it, um, but I, I, I guess I didn't yet grasp the um, sort of like the community building and like um, interpersonal elements that are woven in there with, at, the, at the heritage program. So that was, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Nisha anyway. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, as Kayla said, there's three rotating topics, right? So there's the ecological perspectives, there's a uh, language, and I always mess up the last year. It's something about sovereignty and current issues. I'm getting a, a thumbs up. That's roughly what they learn. <laughs> I know generally what we learn in that class, but I've taken it what, two, three times now. Um, but that's, that's generally what students are doing. And then in their senior year, they complete a senior project where they're off, most often relating um, their major to a need of the tribal community, though it can be anything they're interested in. So that's generally what the program looks like. And I put this picture up here intentionally because I wanted to emphasize, it's a picture of folks after a Makasena workshop. Um, because, you know, we have these classroom experiences for the Heritage Award program. 
But as has been alluded to, there are so many learning opportunities outside of the classroom. And those are often driven by the students themselves asking for these experiences, right? Asking, can we do, can we make makasina? So we brought in Scott Shoemaker <laughs> to teach how to make makasina, right? So that's another example of a learning experience that students have. And so how is and was your experience similar or different from that expectation? Yeah, uh, I was blown away. Um, I'm trying to think that uh, I caught one half of uh, language, I think, and then it was um, sovereignty contemporary issues. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, and then everything that was built. Around, so, you know, you say it's like a one credit class that you take every Tuesday evening but like there's um uh there was dinner you know that you could people would go to um and and so just like the the um, amount of wealth of knowledge and to steal metaphors from other presentations like the stoking of embers that like were so obvious there in like the classroom um it was really just amazing like like just um you could ask any question and just there's a million rabbit holes that everyone was willing to dive into. Um, yeah, just really, really fascinating and really gratifying to um, learn uh, um, how not only this is relevant to us as um, uh, uh, like, like our ancestors, but understanding how other people and pe our peers uh, within the tribe are um, reacting and dealing with these issues. I think that's a really cool space for us to have. Um, like I said, I didn't really know what to expect too much. Um, and then like I said, there was that disappointment when it wasn't the language class this semester. But I would say I was really just, I, I wasn't expecting to learn as much as I have or in the aspects that I did. Um, you know, it's like you said, it's one credit hour class every Tuesday night. And you think, how much can you put into that one credit hour? But I feel like I have honestly learned more from this class than my five credit hour classes. Um, and, and more about myself, more about my community. Um, I'd never expected to have, you know, the, uh, you always heard like, oh, yeah, there's a community there. But you never expected it to actually be like, like a family. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Mishime, or... So another unique component to this experience, <clears throat> excuse me, right? So there's the, the Miyamiya Heritage class, um, but then there's also advising and staff support. So you've heard many times today, there's a lot of staff now at the Miyamiya Center, and so students can come um, you know, speak with any of us if they they need to, um, and directly have the support of what you know was Bobby and is now Kara, who acts as an advisor within the Miyamiya Center. And so I was hoping that you all could talk about your experience uh, with the Miyamiya Heritage class. I know we've kind of gotten at that a little bit, but if any of you have anything to add, and then also with the advising and su uh, staff support at the Miyamiya Center. So I was hoping that Mika or Brad could talk about the class a little bit. Yep. So not to draw any more attention to my age, but I am quite removed um, from my time here. And so it's really been interesting to hear my fellow panelists' experiences. Mine was quite different. Um, I can't remember how many students there were sort of when I was going, how many tribal students there were. It wasn't a, a small number by any means, but we definitely did not have the same sort of um, camaraderie, if you will. And I think that was just, you know, we didn't really have the same... Uh, backing and, and history and I'm really excited to hear sort of how it's been for you all. I don't think we did like dinners after class or anything but I will say that despite that there are people that um, you know that I met through the program that are relatives of mine now that you know this many years out we still have this bond now that we probably wouldn't have if we were just um, you know alumni and um, I also think that the 
environment of this university, um, as well as the whole world, has changed a lot, especially in the last two years. And um, I'm really happy to see that I think it's a much more inclusive environment for Miamia students that in a way that I don't think necessarily existed for us, for me, um, when I was going here. Remember, maybe some of you know or remember that this place was called J. Crew U. I hope it's not anymore. Um, it was known as a really preppy, rich, white school. <laughs> and um, that was a lot of my experience going here. I had to explain to a girl in my freshman dorm why you don't use the word oriental to, de to describe people. She didn't know. Um, she's from Cleveland. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so, you know, um, I, again, I'm just, I'm really happy to hear that this is what it's turned into. So many things that didn't exist when I was, um, you know, a, pre-college and certainly while I went to school here and I'm just really pleased to see um, how much it's changed and how much I think the university and the tribe have really held up that commitment that they you know the whole reason why we're here here today um, that it wasn't just lip service so um, I guess you know just I'm, I'm very hopeful for what's going to happen from here on out and excited for future prospective students if there are any out there I hear a baby crying you know maybe mine will go here too so yeah that's that's my thoughts there Uh, yeah, I never, um, I don't think I spoke to a counselor in my life until um, Bobby pulled me into her office. Uh, and so I, yeah, I didn't know what that was, what was going to happen. I thought I was in trouble. But so it was nice to know that she, and again, it, it was a different relationship because I had, you know, three years into the university. It, I didn't really need help you know, getting my feet into, you know, the academic uh, rhythm of, uh, of, uh, of, of Miami. Um, but yeah, it was, it was nice to have, um, have that support. Um, and I got it, I started working at the Miami Center, I think my scene, right at the beginning of my senior year, maybe a little before that, um, doing like GIS work, because I was a geography major. Um, and so I sort of, I feel like I got a lot of, um, roundabout um, um, sort of um, support through that. So working with Daryl and, and uh, George and Andrew Strack, uh, uh, it was a much smaller office. So we were like all on top of each other at that point. And we would just like dream about like, how cool would it be to have like that one room in the bottom house? And you know, it's gone beyond that. Um, but it, it, was, it was cool to see the transition um, where like we would hang out in the office, we would be right. I mean, I don't know how Andrew Strack worked honestly, because we would just be right there, annoying him um, and just egging him on. Um, but uh, so we had that space, and now like as I come back and revisit, um, as we all do, uh, you know, you never really leave. Um, seeing like students just like totally like sprawled out across like chairs and just hang like like it's not a question about can they be there like the whole center has created space for them to you know have have a have a little corner of the university for uh for ourselves so it's very very nice to see that support Pertaining to uh, the courses, uh, a lot how I see it is out of these courses, you can, they have, of course, a theme and a set kind of criteria or a curriculum that they're going to teach us, but it definitely becomes what do we want to learn? There's a lot of opportunities where we can suggest. Uh, just this past uh, semester, I've offered, like, asked George, I was like, hey, is there some sort of course we can talk about? Like, how did I identify it? what is Miami and such like that? And without any hesitation almost within a couple classes of them getting planned up. We had course list talking about it and stuff like that, having a full course discussion in class stuff like that. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities that as long as we're able to, what we can think of and what we want to know about our culture and different aspects and stuff like that. There are plenty of people around the staff who are just willing to make it for what we can and stuff like that. And there's a lot that we learned from it of basis and what we asked for. So that's pretty great. And dealing with uh, as well with that with the staff, uh, it's been very inclusive with the staff because, of course, we can ask for classes and or different programs or activities. 
but sometimes you just want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're not quite understanding or can I learn more about this and stuff like that. And of course they have office at all certain hours are working stuff like that, but around the clock, they will work with you, talk with you. You can go in their office as long as they're not super busy. They'll love to have a discussion with you and just teach you all about what you want to learn or give you more resources of how to figure out what it, which has been very helpful throughout the years. And just interacting with the staff for the past couple of years has been pretty great. And so for this past year, this last semester, I've started working on the dictionary with Chinguia, which has been an amazing opportunity for me to learn more in depth about our language and how it goes about creating words or how we find our words and create our system to give out to the community and what sort of language we need for the community has been a great opportunity working with. And so that's been a very supportive staff of working as a student and then full-time student and then having to go to coursework and stuff like that. It can be overwhelming, but it's very flexible hours and very accommodating and all that such. So that's been a great opportunity that I've been a part of. I would say the staff at the Miamia Center is very accommodating and understanding um, with being a mom and having life going on, they're always willing to be like, oh, you could bring your kids or, um, oh, you just had surgery. Why don't you let me email your teachers and I'll get it taken care of um, kind of thing. Um, Kara always laughs at me when I tell her this, but she has literally been like my lifeline. I don't think I would even be here if it wasn't for her because I was so nervous about the concept of going back to college. Um, and every time I would contact her, it was just like, oh, yeah, you got this. You can do this. Like, don't worry about your age or nobody will think that you're older. <laughs> um, she's pretty much just been like my support system, even though she just laughs and doesn't believe it. So. So out of our research, we've identified that something that a lot of students talk about, and I think Daryl mentioned this yesterday, is that Many students have this like aha moment or what we call a formative experience that really shifts the way they view their Miami identity, right? So it shifts gradually over the course of the four years, but for a lot of them, there's like one thing that just really connects things for them, right? Things like study abroad trips, the participating in National Breath of Life, becoming a counselor for camps, attending a winter gathering even. So I was curious for you all, what experience or experiences have shifted your perspective of your Miami identity? Um, so I have, there, there, there's two, I think there's like phases to this. Um, so again, I started this second semester of a year and winter gathering is January, end of January. Um, so I was invited and, you know, I mean, I really wanted to go and I was nervous about it. I don't know if I talked to people on the bus cause I just felt like, I, you know, like I'm a phony. Um, and then uh, in Oklahoma, um, you know, I got hugs from the business committee. I think your mom hugged me and it was just like, yeah, uh, you know, and it was just like, oh, okay. Like, this is not a question. Like, this is, this is absolutely wonderful. This is, um, you know, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so that, that was like, that was definitely like that rev the engine of you know like generating like my identity as a Miami person and then my job uh, as a GIS I don't know specialist I'll say um, that was really um, really really good for me because it kind of like swirled everything I was doing together into one thing so like it's it was history and it was GIS and it was kind of ecology it was um, um, language and uh, uh, all of this was merging into one thing and I could like see not just my identity um, being like generated from that and the information I was gleaning from all the work that I was doing and conversations I was having with people um, but um, I was also seeing like um, like myself and like a career um, like create itself you know like I like saw that path of like all these individual things I was interested in and think about all the time 
um, turning into something um, productive and meaningful um, to myself and um, to, to people I cared about. So uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely that opportunity that was given to me. And again, it was, I think I mentioned I took GIS and I think George's face lit up and brought me in. Yeah, so kind of similar to Brad, um, this summer after my freshman year, I was offered a six-week internship in Miami, Oklahoma at our uh, Heritage Museum with Megan Dory. And just in terms of like being an adult, I guess, like I had just turned 19. It was my first time like flying by myself. I was going to this strange place to do this job with these people I had never met before. So in terms of that, like, just adulthood, that was a pretty formative experience. But then in terms of this community, um, it was just the first time where I really, really felt like the people in this community cared for me. And I was starting to feel that like reciprocated feeling. Um, like we hit weather and my flight was delayed one of the nights. And that night, like Bobby Burke was texting me and Kara was emailing me and people were calling me. And like, so many people from the center were spending their Thursday night or whatever, making sure that I was okay. Um, and then it was kind of like an immersive experience culturally, just working in the museum every day under Megan. Um, I got to learn a lot. Um, I was spending time at the tribal headquarters, uh, spending time with the employees there. Akema Lankford actually had to come um, save me from a tornado. So I got to spend some time with him in a storm shelter underground. That was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, that experience was just like really the first time that I got to interact with the community in a way that was really unique and special to me. So, you know, our students are also multifaceted, right? They don't just exist as Miamia students on campus. They're doing other things as well. Um, and, you know, identity right is is very intersectional and all of those things that we do and all of our identities impact one another and so i was hoping that you all could talk about how does what you learn in the heritage course change the way that you experience these other aspects of your life things like but not not exclusive of right classes jobs extracurriculars So um, I guess I went from being a stay-at-home mom for about six years to going to school. And I realized at that moment that, sorry, I might get a little emotional. It's kind of who I am. Um, I didn't know who I was anymore. I had completely turned into nothing but a mom. I didn't know what I liked or anything. So um, coming here has really mostly even like I said I learned more in this class than anything but I think it's because I'm starting to find myself sorry um I mean there's things that I've enjoyed before this class like going on hikes and stuff but um I actually really have come to enjoy the ecological perspectives class because it takes something that I've already enjoyed like being outside and really like grown off of it so now when I'm out on a hike with my husband, you know, we're really focused on the plants and, oh, did you know you can do this with it? Or, oh, I wonder when we can, like, get some maple trees that we can go tap ourselves or, you know. Um, I've also taken things that we've learned in class and used them in my life. Um, I have a, my daughter is five. She's very into trying to learn the language. Um, and, and we talk a little bit at home, but for the most part, whenever we go to the grocery store together is when we tend to have little conversations back and forth and she'll ask me what something is and I'll tell her or I'll tell her I don't know. Um, and I'll say, I'll look it up later. Um, so we go through the aisles of the store and um, pretty much I would say just the biggest part has been working on finding myself and things that I enjoy. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer this question. Uh, it's, I mean, it's everything. I don't, you know, it's, it's absolutely everything. You don't turn it off. Um, uh, 
like I exa exactly what you said about hiking, just like going outside. Um, yeah, you uh, I don't know. You love everything that you, you love everything you already loved more. Um, and you you see new things that you 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 love in a new way. Um, but you know, I, I, I guess it's just like revisiting things and, um, uh, I'm, I don't know how to say this. I'm, I'm trying to bring it to Dungeons and Dragons. I am, but I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm getting there. I don't know how to weave it. Uh, so, so I mean, but before that, like it takes you to reassess. I mean, it's, it's like Neo in the matrix, right? Like you like, you see everything new. And so then you start assessing everything and questioning and, and why is it like that? Why is it like that? Why, you know, what this is, you know, a, a conventional American perspective. What's the Miyamia perspective? How does that differ and why? Um, and that's not something that anyone has an answer to, but you constantly ask it anyways. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic, I was lonely. I assume others were as well. And um, I never played Dungeons and Dragons, but it's clearly up my alley. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's something I knew I had. Um, I had like minds. I knew I had like minds. And so there was a group that I reached out to amongst, um, uh, um, you know, um, amongst Miyamiake. I said, hey, like, do you want to do this? Like, let's like, you can do it virtually. Like, we now, we now know that can happen, right? Like that we can do things virtually. So let's just do it. And a few people got interested. It, and then more people got interested. Um, and suddenly it turned into, um, you know, two groups of four, essentially, you know, I think there's like seven people total or something. So, uh, so I set up Dungeons and Dragons and I try to use Miyamiya Tawenge and things, trying to conceive of a world that operates under Miyamiya perspective. So it's not just like guys going out with axes and killing everything they see for gold. Um, but like, what does it mean to be a good Miyamiya person? How can we act together, even though uh, we can't do that together all the time? How do we how do we want to act together, and who do we want to be together? So, trying to craft that narrative together uh, is, yeah, something that we're still figuring out, and we will never figure out. But that is the point: is that we always try to. Yeah, so it's definitely hard to put into words um, how, like, once you start learning about things from a Miyamiya perspective, you don't really stop. You just, like, slowly start more and more seeing things as a Miyamiya person, and I can't think of any better way to say that. Um, but, like, one sp thing specifically that kind of came to mind when Haley asked us this question was the language courses or just kind of learning this language in general. And it kind of changed a lot of other facets of my life because it gave me this like solid thing that I could share with my friends who weren't Miyamiya. And it gave me opportunities to talk about my culture with my other friends in a way that I hadn't really before. Um, like one of my other roommates is Miyamiya. So sometimes we'll be like speaking little phrases around the house and our other two roommates wanna know, you know, like, what are you guys saying? Like, what does that mean? Um, so I think that's definitely a big part of like kind of that shift in perspective. I have to say I am in one of those D&D &D groups and my group is primarily women and he gets so frustrated because we never do what he expects us to do. <laughs> we don't kill anything in our group. <laughs> but on the other hand, how have these other experiences that you've had also influenced the way you learn and interact within the Miyamiya community? I definitely have a different experience just because I'm what I tell the other students is called old. Um, but 
I didn't grow up in the Miami community necessarily. I have interacted a lot with the Native community, but I've come to find that the Native community and the Miami community, there's a pretty big difference. Um, and so I've, I've been learning a lot about being a Miami person, but I think that one thing that's cool that I had brought to the table, I would guess would say, is um, some of those things from outside. I've had um, multiple students come to me and ask me to teach them how to do beadwork. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had found some time to do that yet between classes, but we'll get there. Um, I've also taken some of the persimmons that we processed in class. Um, I've worked at a couple different bakeries, and so I took that and adjusted some of our recipes and baked stuff with them and brought it into class. Um, another thing um, we're actually getting ready to do in the next few weeks, um, I've had the experience of ordering eagle feathers and parts from the repository many times and process those and use them to build things like regalia for powwows. Um, and that's something I actually had just gotten um, a tail in and we're going to be processing that in class and teaching about how to respect those and how to go about the process of getting them and things like that. Um, so I feel like even though I'm trying to learn as a Miami person, I've been able to take some of my experiences as a native person um, and try to help educate other people as well. So I think this is another question that many of you have already answered in various ways, but if anything new comes to mind, um, how has your view of your Miami identity changed since starting the Heritage Program? And for alum, how has it changed since graduating? Um, again, some of these things are really hard to put into words, but I think the easiest way to talk about how my identity has changed since I've started this program is just saying that, like, I feel Miamia now. And before when like, I mean, I always knew I was Native American, but I would tell people that like, I came from Native heritage or my ancestors were Native American or like these people from the past were my Miamia and I came from that. But now I feel like I am a Miamia person and I can confidently say I am Miamia. And I think a lot of that just comes from learning about the culture, practicing the culture, being surrounded by Miamia peers and elders on a regular basis and just like truly getting to be a part of it. I, I, I apologize for talking so much, but uh, uh, one, one thing I wanted to add was that like I, uh, it took a long time for me to realize this, but because the Miamia Center is so good at what it does, and it's so integrated with tribal government um, and there's like so many good events um, it took a long time for me to realize that like despite all of those positive things um, that's not the sole source of community and that we as individuals are active members of the community we're not dependent on um, on formal institutions to create events to participate in um, you know it's not like we on know uh, the federal holiday have to do the federal you know events and do things that only you know happen there you know everyone's up to their own um, action so really kind of embodying that and thinking about um, it in a it's a it's a reciprocity thing right it's you know I was sort of just kind of in some ways just taking for a long time and now I'm realizing that you know also as I'm getting older uh, playing playing a different role and performing different responsibilities and in, in um, giving where before I was purely um, sort of taking. Um, I think for me, it I always had a really strong sense of my identity. I think just growing up around the tribe so much and, you know, my grandpa and my family and everything. Um, and then switching gears professionally, working with tribes so much after the fact. I've worked in Indian country all but like four years of my professional life and with all kinds of tribes. I, 
that really opened up my eyes. I only knew this tribe and I knew other tribes existed, but I didn't really think about it that way. And meeting them, I will say, I think we're one of the nicest. I really do. I really, really do. We're one of the most open to people that aren't from our tribe. That's not necessarily common. Um, it's made me think a lot about what sort of allyship looks like as a native person and how to help talk about your native identity, talk about your tribe, talk about, you know, Indian country in general to non-Indians. Because I get that question a lot. I'm sure people here do too. People say, well, what did you think when the Redskins changed their name to the Washington football team? Or what happened when Miami changed its name? You know, those kinds of questions, because that's kind of big in the news right now. And I think uh, native identity and culture and just what tribes are is suddenly so, so much more on the radar than it was. And um, I think a lot about how can I be a I, I like to use the word sort of a good steward as an Indian person and as a Miamia person um, of how I can share who we are. Because I think, you know, we are, we're not a small tribe. We're not a large tribe. And, you know, Native Americans as a whole make up such a teeny tiny population within this country that it is our job to help tell people and tell our story. Um, I always think, too, that if, you know, if we don't, then we're relying on, you know, the encyclopedia page that Brad might have been looking at however many years ago, but it, it also floors me still in 2022, right? <laughs> um, how little people know about tribes, but again, you know, I'm glad we're out there to tell the story. So, and, and here we are telling it often now in our own language. So I think it's wonderful. So that brings us to our final question, right? Again, we're putting on our, uh, hats of imagining something here, but how do you think your life would be different if you didn't attend the Heritage Award program? Uh, personally for me, um, of course I was, as I said, fortunate enough to be pretty involved in the tribe beforehand, but a lot of, um, I guess my participation was solely around, I guess, summertime activities that's when the most influential most like opportunities for me to go especially going growing up in school and stuff like that that's just how things work out with being farther away from the tribe and stuff like that in my own oklahoma and so when i was coming looking at college and stuff like that i don't think if there wasn't the heritage program and i couldn't come to my university i don't think i would have grown as much as a miamia person because growing up in such that i always felt that my miami identity was kind of a summertime activity go have a week at camp, go to the annual meeting, have a great time, be around with family and such, and then go back to school where kids don't really care. They are very unaware of such things, or they would joke around like, oh, that doesn't really matter. That's a thing of the past. You're not like a modern being of identity and such. And so I really struggled with just continuing that all year long. So if Luckily, fortunately, coming here, I've been able to learn how to have my identity constantly and how it's a part of me. And it's not just a summertime activity or when I'm near my community, I can practice it outside and stuff like that. So without probably the heritage course, I wouldn't, one, know as much, but two, not be able to express my identity as Meow Meow as much. I mean, I really, like, I don't know what I would be doing. My I don't know where I'd be working. Um, I think many of you know my mom. Um, she's Japanese. I think everybody in Oxford knows my mom. And I always, you know, my brother and I were really lucky that we really grew up like very, very closely tied to both both sides. And I always assumed that that would be the professional route I would go into. I thought, oh, I'll be a, a translator. I'm going to work in business. Or I wanted to be like a linguist for the FBI. That didn't work out. And um you know, and then now I've found that I've been working now in Indian country for so long. I just I really can't imagine doing anything else for me. I'm so passionate now about how to help Native businesses grow. For those of you that aren't aware, our tribe, as well as many others, operate um, a series of very sophisticated for-profit businesses. And that money is then turned around and sort of replenished back into the community. There's such a huge market now. And, um, you know, tribal ventures are just they're going to go through the roof and it's and it's an exciting time to be a part of that and it's exciting to see what our tribe's doing with that i just think you know i can't imagine what we're going to be talking about at this conference in 10 years or 20 years and i, I really yeah like you said I, I can't imagine it there 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 is not, nothing else so this is who i am you know 
Maybe. So <clears throat> to give you a little bit of broader context, the work that I do in, in the Nipwayona acquisition and assessment team, we're looking at how does language and cultural revitalization impact wellness, right? Like how does it impact the well-being of our community? And I think these stories give you a really good idea of that impact, right? So I, I can give you the data, <laughs> but I don't think that that data really comes to life without the experiences of our tribal members, of all of uh, many of you, without you all. So I hope that everyone can join me in saying Mishinewe. Big thanks to our panelists here. <laughs> And you're welcome to come chat with me, or I'm, I'm going to offer their time if you want to chat with any of the panelists. <laughs> I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, but you're welcome to come chat with me if you'd like after this. So, Mishinewe. There we go. We're back. Well, we have covered a lot of ground today. And, um, you know, it's, it's clear from these presentations that, that our beginning was very simple. But we are em emerging to meet the complex demands of this kind of work. And it's not easy work, and I, I hope that you, you get that. When I think about the speakers that we've had here today, I, th I think of skill, passion, motivation, all of these things kind of come to my mind. And I think of these speakers as my colleagues, my friends, and obviously my relations. I am related, many of us are related to each other. I cannot think of a more talented group to work with. I feel very fortunate. I've had a lot of different roles that I've played in my life, um, different positions, um, but I find myself at a point in this time when I'm absolutely enjoying the, uh, the talent that, that I'm surrounded with. So I want to extend a, a heartfelt uh, mission to everyone who's had a hand uh, in this conference, all of the staff of the Miamia Center, and I mean all of the staff of the Miamia Center, all of our tribe students, all of our tribe students had uh, responsibilities throughout this entire event, our Miami tribe leaders, who have been unwavering in their support for us and our community. If it wasn't for the community wanting to engage, to be part of this, it would be very difficult to move this forward. So to that end, if you'll just join me in just giving everyone a big hand. I also want to acknowledge the alumni group for video and offering this on also to Miami University Marketing and Communications, who have handled a lot of our communication side. So there's just been a, a tremendous amount of support. And we're only getting started in celebrating this 50-year relationship. And I hope I see many more of you at, at future events. So, all right. <clears throat> A couple of quick announcements. Um, all of the speakers are going to be at their tables. Um, it's still early enough in the day. I encourage you to spend some time visiting. And then for all of the tribe student alumni, if you could go down to the atrium, that would be two sets of stairs down to the front. Uh, we'd like to do a group shot down there. Okay. Out the door and to the left, I'm told. <laughs> 